Bob Falls? Here. President Swan? Here. Lou Ferris? Here. Good. Rick, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? The staff has none. Okay, terrific. Um, because we have a, a relatively large agenda tonight and uh, quite a few uh, attendees participating as well, we're going to limit the oral communications to three minutes per person instead of the uh, five minutes. So at this point in time, we're open for oral communications. And this is where any one of the attendees can, uh, can bring up anything uh, that's not on the agenda. And... Uh, you have your opportunity, so. No, I can't, uh, you know, let's leave it stayed in this mode, whoever's running this thing, so I can see the attendees. Okay. Um, so I don't see any hands up from any of the attendees. Okay. We'll assume that means there are no questions. So we can move on to uh, unfinished business. Rick? I'll, I'll, introduce, I'll introduce the item and then turn it over to the uh, finance manager. Um, this is the low income rate assistance program. Uh, the budget and finance committee recommended that staff propose a low income rate assistance program. <clears throat> uh, Lyra uh, be presented to the full board for approval as follows a one year pilot program to be funded in the amount of $25,000 funding to be appropriated uh, from a reduction in uh, operational expenses requiring a budget amendment and not funded through uh, the reserve fund and a letter of support for uh, assembly bill 401. It's recommended that the board of directors adopt the attached resolution approving a one year pilot uh, rate assistance program that's attached funded in the amount of $25,000 and review and comment regarding the attached draft letter of support for AB 401. And the draft letter of support came out, was posted to the agenda, and I hope you all uh, received it. We did have some issues uh, with our website being down for, for maintenance through our uh, provider. Uh, the district has been discussing different ways to uh, implement a, a LIRA program for our district. Staff has developed the proposed policy that can work as a baseline platform. This can be considered a pilot program or to be the program based on the level of interest. The program could be expanded or, ex expanded or modified in the future. The proposed policy is considered uh, the baseline option. So the district believes that there are approximately 1,200 households enrolled in the PG&E care program. Uh, this could be increasing due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. There will likely be a high volume of interest the first six months, <coughs> excuse me, along with inquiries uh, on an ongoing basis. An annual re renewal process will also take a portion of time each year. Um, uh, based on review of other agency programs, staff feels a $25,000 and a 200 applicant program is reasonable for the district our size. The finance committee requested funding be appropriated from a reduction in operational expenses requiring a budget amendment uh, and not from the uh, our reserve fund. Proposed account expenditure reductions are as follows. Uh, the finance uh, department uh, reduced uh, per professional service, uh, computer equipment, postage and training to uh, $14,000. The administration department, um, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency annual contribution and training, $6,000. Engineering, a reduction in scanning services, $2,000. Um, operation, a reduction in building maintenance, small tools, travel training in the amount of $2,000, supply and treatment, a uh, reduction in building maintenance, and in small tools to make our total uh, reduction is $25,000. If approved, staff will return with a budget amendment incorporating these changes to the budget. As part of the recommendation of the budget committee, the committee requested a letter of support for AB 401. This legislation was passed in 2015 that directs the State Water Resource Control Board to propose a plan for a statewide low-income uh, uh, rate assistance program for water. 
uh, in the agenda there uh, and in the uh, website attached for your review and comment is the draft letter. And now I'll ask the uh, director of finance to introduce the rate assistance program. Stephanie. Hello, so the rate assistance draft program is attached based on, we, we kind of looked at the $25,000, the number of customers, how best we could efficiently implement and manage a program on an ongoing basis. Uh, this would make it so that it is set up to be $10 discount per regular bill for up to 208 customers. It would be on a first come first serve basis. So as people submit a full packet, they get approved in. If we have excess of 208 customers, we would then start a wait list. And as people either move out of the area or when it's the annual renewal time, they do not, um, they do not renew or if they no longer qualify for the program, they're supposed to let us know. And then we would go down the wait list. And then as those people were able to, um, sometimes they, they, it, depending on the time frame, they may have to re-show re proof of eligibility and then they would be accepted into the program. So we're anticipating a high volume in the beginning. We're going to leverage PG&E's care program um, to essentially make that the process. If it is a tenant, you know, they just have to prove that, you know, they do have a, a lease agreement with the owner. Um, and essentially, you know, this is set up to be a manageable starting point to where we could go upward for this. This is limited for it being uh, uh, individually metered residential or multi-residential property, uh, meaning that just because a complex has one person, but it's all ran through the main master account and not in that person's name, they would not, you know, that would not be eligible. Um, it would have to be uh, individually metered. The, you know, the same person's name that's on the water bill is on the pg e care program. Um, and again, this is a draft, so I'm more than happy to, you know, answer any questions or clarify or if there's areas that we think we want to elaborate more. Um, definitely, this is the time to do some of that. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> Uh, okay, do we have any uh, questions uh, from any of the board members or comments? I do. How, I, do, we, how yeah. do we do this? How do we let you know we want to comment? You raise your hand normally. Raise your hand like that? Icon. Well, Lois, that's, you know, since you're on the screen, I can see it, but there's a, there's a feature on your computer screen that allows you to raise your hand. But uh, you're, you're, you're recognized I, right I now. didn't get in last time, so where is it? I'm not seeing it this time. It's not there. Yeah, you have to go down at the bottom and click <clears throat> on the participants icon. And then when that comes up, the raise hand is in the lower right-hand corner. Okay. I, right, do you see everybody's I, name on the right side of the screen, Lois? I clicked on that. But we, we might want to do some training on this um, at a separate time. Yeah. So, Lois, if you don't see everybody's name on the right side of your screen, correct? You don't see our I name? I see everybody, but <clears throat> I see their pictures and stuff. No, no. It's a list of names down the right-hand side of the screen. It says participants. Push that. Click that. I pushed on it. Okay. Now it came. <laughs> yeah. Now... Now, if you look, as Bob says, the lower right-hand corner of that area, you'll see a button called oh, raise hand. I see it. It says raise hand. Click that. Okay. Bingo. Now, do you see the hand next to your name on the right-hand side where everybody's name is? I see it. Okay. I see it by my picture, too. Okay. And that's what means you've raised your hand. So you can click it again to lower it after I said, Lois, you're recognized. Tell us what you want to say. Okay. 
Well, <clears throat> I kind of brought this up at the budget and finance committee um, as a pilot program. And Stephanie was there and uh, Director Fultz was there and our, our citizen member. And we decided that this would work best as a pilot program until we have an idea how it's going to go, how much it's gonna, how much time it would take up of staff, a lot of various things, but we um, decided to have it come oh. to the board for the board to decide. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Lois. <laughs> Anybody else with a comment or a question? Well, I have a few things I'd like to say, but I'll, I'll wait till uh, the public has time to participate. I'll wait till after, if that's okay, Steve. Okay, sure, that's fine. Any other uh, comments from anybody at the on the board? Seeing none, okay, let's go to the uh, the public, which it now outnumbers the board two to one. Do we have any questions or comments from um, any of our attendees? Okay. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, let's start with Beth. You're at the top of my list, so unmute yourself and feel free. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I very strongly support a program to help people in our community who have difficulty, financial difficulty with their bills. Um, I don't think that this is a program that's meaningful enough uh, to really be of help. But I think, and I, and I think that if the board decides to go with this program, that it needs to really make a commitment to um, continuing the push on the state and continuing to not losing sight of this uh, program a year down the road and, and letting it go. I think we need to really work hard to make sure that uh, it becomes an effective and a, a program and one that's available to uh, more than 200 people out of 1,200 in our community. But I do support there being a program like this. Thank you, Thanks. Beth. Uh, Mr. Mosier. You're currently muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. I just want to echo Beth's comments. I, uh, I'm very uh, uh, supportive of this as a pilot program. I appreciate the board's attention to this. Um, and um, I understand the need to test, test it out, but I hope the board will be committed to expanding this. This is an extraordinary time. Uh, on the one hand, water is a fundamental human right as the state has now recognized. On the other hand, the cost of water is going up and people's, many people have facing terrible financial crises. And so this is a program that uh, tries to deal with the, these two um, forces that are at play now. So uh, I just want to express my support and appreciation to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Any other uh, questions or comments from the public? Uh, Mr. Ford. Let's see, here we go. Uh, thank you. I just want to add my endorsement of this program for the same reasons that have been stated. I think it's really important to get a program out there. And uh, I think it also um, needs to be increased or perhaps lower for even for this trial period to lower it from 200 to 100 people so that you could double the amount of money that uh, people would get. I think it has to be a significant contribution like Beth said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Any other comments or questions from the public? Okay, not seeing any. Go back to uh, Rick, you wanted to, uh, Moran, Director Moran, yes. you had a comment? Yes, I do. Um, well, I think we should stay within our means. I like that. Um, I, you know, wish that we could help more, 
but I understand that you know the whole water district faces the same problem that uh, certain individuals do as well. Um, and I so it's a good start. Um, I was glad to see the reduction in other departments, other departments making adjustments to help during a time of crisis. So uh, that's you know people within the water district pitching in. So I'm, I appreciate that. The one thing, other thing is um, I think this needs an aggressive outreach program so that we make sure that uh, this reaches the people most in need of assistance. So, you know, I would hope that this is what uh, Chatterbox could be able to do, um, but we need to make sure that people know about this program so they can apply for it. And that, that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Director Fultz. Yes, I have a number of uh, number of things I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, at the at the high level, in terms of state level policy, we are actually in a position right now where the state policy contradicts itself. Um, on, on the one hand, it it talks about uh, water being a human right, uh, on which is um, uh, stated in the AB four hundred one. On the other hand, it also talks about how water really needs to be um, the same cost for everybody and that the money that comes in from water actually cannot be used for uh, doing these kinds of uh, rate shifting and um, assistance. So that fundamental conflict is what needs to be resolved. And if the legislature is really serious about uh, AB 401, which is not exactly clear that they are, um, they need to resolve that conflict as quickly as possible. Um, and, and to back that up with the financial resources, the particularly really small districts like ours that do not have the scale of uh, East Bay Mud or um, LA water or anything like that can't necessarily uh, take on. And I'm hopeful that um, they will recognize that going forward. Um, I, I hear what um, uh, folks have said about this needing to be larger. Um, I do want to make sure that we all understand what that means. So if we were to take, let's say 1200 people and apply $20 a month for 12 months, we'd need almost $300,000. That means that we would have to either find cost savings or um, rate increases or a reduction in the amount of money that is available for things like infrastructure in that same amount. And if it were a rate increase, we're basically looking at the other 6,800 uh, uh, customers of ours needing to pay an additional $40 uh, or, or so a month, a year for uh, water in order to make up the shortfall uh, if we wanted to maintain the margin that's a, uh, that we can apply to infrastructure. And this is a very serious thing because it's not a question of the percentage of the overall revenue, it's a percentage of the margin that you have available for other things. And we have a topic on the agenda later to talk about some of those items. So um, in order to accomplish that, you'd have to be going into property tax revenue because, which I believe uh, Gina had said you could use since it's not directly related to water. Um, so that is uh, something for everybody to consider. Uh, we are in this place right now in large part because of the massive ramp up of operating expenses. And so that directly relates to the, the cost of water that we have right now. Um, and make no mistake, 1,200 to 1,500 subscribers is somewhere around 15 to 20% of our subscriber base. So that's very significant. I share the concern that I'm not convinced that this is actually going to go to help the people, the 200 to 300 of our customers that routinely have issues paying their bills. There's absolutely no guarantee 
that that's going to happen even with an outreach. And so when I look at that, I then have to go, well, what is the most fair and transparent way of administering this? And I don't believe actually that it's a first in, um, first come, first serve. Um, folks that are well informed and have been following this uh, certainly have all of their uh, information available. Others who may be in a different situation, struggling, trying to stay employed, uh, trying to figure out what they're going to do to support their family may not have that attention. And so I think we really need to take a step back here and look at a lottery system um, that would, in my, because I do believe this will be oversubscribed. And in my view, the lottery system, if we can't guarantee that it goes to the people that really, really need it, a lottery system is a, is a fairer way to, uh, to address this. Uh, it wasn't clear to me, by the way, if once you're in the program, you stay in as long as you um, uh, remain eligible. But under a lottery system or a system I have in mind, I think that would be the only fair thing to do. That is, you're not uh, re-upping your place in line every year. Um, so the, um, so I'd, I'd like to see this modified to a lottery system. The last thing is I, I wasn't really sure, and I may have just missed this in the resolution and the program, but nothing in there said that this actually was a pilot program. Uh, the only place that we talk about pilot program is in the, um, is in the introductory uh, page, but reading the resolution and, and the program, I didn't see that that was specified. In fact, it looked very much like this was being proposed as a permanent program. So if the board wants this to be a pilot program only, I think the language that gets uh, voted on, that actually gets voted on, needs to make that very, very clear so that we're not setting expectations for uh, our ratepayers uh, at odds with what our intention is. Again, in the interest of fairness and transparency, we need to make sure we're very clear about that. As of right now, the way I think it's written is this is a permanent program um, and, or the, the, anybody reading this that may not be involved in the details like we are, we'll read it as a permanent program, and it's just a matter of what the funding level is from, from year to year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Lois, I see you have a yes. blue hand up again. Yep. Um, well, I know this is woefully inadequate amount of money. I get that. But we don't know how it's going to work. I did mention it as a pilot program from the beginning, uh, just to test the waters, to see the interest, to see how difficult it would be for staff to work on this and how time consuming. And yeah, we have a lot of things that the district needs to do. And unfortunately, we don't have money for everything we'd like to do. And I, I just felt like as a pilot program, we could test the waters, so to speak. And that I'm not suggesting it's a permanent plan. Um, it would be nice if we could do it. But we it's difficult for us to always know why people are having a problem paying their bills why they're on the late uh, notices that because that's just a way of life for some people they pay their bills late i know that from having worked with credit unions and making loans to people it's just a way of life for some people um, for other people, it's frankly, they don't have the money. So it's pretty hard to know why they haven't paid their bill in a timely manner. We, we just don't have the information to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just had a <clears throat> question. If, uh, if, if someone's on the program uh, and they are on it for a, a month or two, 
and then fail to pay their bill, do they get do they get taken off the program? Does anybody know that? It wouldn't it wouldn't be simply if they didn't pay their bill, they would be able to go through the past dues process, but if they do get their water turned off for non-payment, they would be removed from the program. Okay. And uh, okay. Let's see, we have, what do we have? Well, I'm gonna break with my rules. And I'll go back to the audience and Beth, if you have something compelling to share, please I'll recognize you and you get an opportunity. Put your hands up and you're on mute. There you go. Beth, your hand is still up and you're still on mute. Can you hear me, Steve? Yes. Okay, good. There was some problem on this end. Um, I, I do have a couple of quick questions. Um, one, is, uh, one is, if the intention is there, and it sounds like the intention is there from uh, board members who have spoken about this, if the intention is there to attempt to go beyond a pilot year, uh, it seems like there should be work done starting immediately on figuring out how you would pay for it in out years. Uh, and I would hope that that would become part of the budgeting process and when you have the time to start working on that, um, unless somebody has a plan for that already. It doesn't, you know, I mean, the identified uh, reductions in budget have, have been identified out of this year's budget since we have only that budget to work with. Um, the other question I had, because I just have such nightmares about uh, being very vocal and transparent about offering this program and having, you know, 500 people want to take advantage of it and you can afford to give a $10 a month, you know, break to such a much, much smaller number of people. I'm wondering if, if anybody has explored whether through the CARES program there's a way of identifying the lowest income and doing uh, reaching out to those people particularly. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I don't I don't know that we've have any answers for this. I don't know that anybody's worked out any long-term program uh, thoughts on this for financing it. If if we have, feel free to mention it. Um, and I, I, um, I'm, I'm unaware of any planning that's going on. I think the reason we keep hearing the term pilot is simply to see what the response is, how many people are interested in participating, um, you know, seeing how many people qualify based on the, the uh, items that have been listed, you know, to, to qualify someone, and then see how the program works. If they actually, you know, take advantage of the discount and continue to pay their bill, or if there's other issues that crop up. So I think it's in the spirit of a pilot program, which I don't know if it says it in there or not, but we certainly are identifying it as such to see how it goes for some period of time and then adjust as, as we go forward. Uh, okay, once again, I'll break with my own rule. Mark Lee, you have your hand up. This will be the last comment from the attendees until we decide to vote on this issue. Go ahead, Mark. You're on mute. Hi. Thank you for uh, discussing this issue. I think it's really important. I've heard, uh, several questions and a couple of comments. One, I appreciate uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Fultz's uh, concern about not getting state uh, involved in the uh, statewide program. One, that's important. I agree with that. We should probably try to lobby our legislature to get this implemented. Two, uh, I am concerned about the, the issue that he's proposing, talking about uh, Commissioner Fultz, uh, doing a, lotter, a lottery system. I'm not sure how the lottery system would be to what extent of the uh, people that are in the district uh, being served by the district is there uh, how that lottery would be initiated and how, what what criteria 
would you be included in the population that would be allowed to participate in the lottery? Is that going to be done by strictly income based on the, uh, the current criteria that's uh, in the proposal before us? Uh, those are issues that we need to discuss. Uh, the third item is, I think it is important to at least try to do a pilot program, try it out for a year using current cost savings from the existing budget. And even if we only have 200 people, or not 200 people, uh, uh, the uh, the number that are, uh, it was actually less than that, was serving of 25,000, only allowing $25,000 of the budget to be used. I think that's a good starting point. Try it out, evaluate it, and see how it impacts the overall budget. I don't think it'll really have a, a main impact. My concern is how the decision making is going to be made. And is it, if it's first come, first serve, you know it's going to be filled up rapidly. And I, I don't quite buy the uh, issue regarding those people that are, are struggling and not paying their bills are not participating. We could be advertising using public information and take some time to unroll the program. So I don't buy that that uh, that concern. And finally, uh, I think uh, Lois was right. Uh, Commissioner uh, Lois, Director Lois was was correct that we should try it out as a pilot program. There are a lot of people under duress who can't the bills. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Um... Rick? I, I have one other comment, Steve, if I can. Rick Rogers is recognized. Yep. Well, it doesn't, doesn't matter, but I just want to clarify what staff is proposing um, from uh, the past meetings we've had, uh, just uh, board meetings and budget uh, committee meetings. We're proposing a one-year pilot program to um, fund at the rate of $25,000 um, first come, first serve based on the PG&E uh, LIRA program. And that's what's being proposed, and we can modify that resolution to state if the council doesn't have an issue with that, that it is a pilot program. That's what's being recommended from uh, committees and past board meetings. Yeah, and if I, if I could just yeah. follow on that, um, the way the policy is written, um, it's correct, it doesn't say you know, pilot right on the policy. Um, but the way the language is written, um, it wouldn't continue after one year unless it were renewed with new funding. Um, however, it would it could be renewed very easily simply by committing new funding to the program and failing to, um, you know, discontinue it in another year. So I, I think it has a couple of advantages in that it doesn't automatically last beyond a year, but it could easily be rolled over for another year if it's um, for however many years uh, the board wants if it turns out to work as written. Sure. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Rick. Um, uh, Rick, you had another? I mean, Rick Moran, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I, I want to agree with Bob about the imperfections of a first come, first serve uh, basis, all right? Um, and I think what we're dealing here is neither one of them is perfect. Um, the last time I dealt with the lottery, I ended up in the Navy for four years and going to Vietnam. So I'm, I'm not a, a real big fan of lotteries, but uh, I understand that neither system is perfect. Um, but uh, the immediacy of this, um, at least at this point, um, would suggest that uh, the first come first serve, highly um, advertised, and um, when we see as this pilot program unravels here, maybe we can uh, adjust how we do it uh, with some fourth, with some uh, 2020 hindsight here as we go forward. That's me there. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Bob, you had another follow up? Yeah, some very specific things. So, you know, again, uh, I, I get the point about immediacy, but that, in fact, is what makes it uh, unfair, whereas putting everybody, if you're going to have a limitation where not everybody who would be eligible under the PG CARES program um, actually can get a benefit, then 
in the interest of fairness, you really don't have uh, an alternative uh, because, like I say, there's people that already have their applications ready to go. And by the time we would get uh, any kind of widespread advertising out, it's, 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 I think it's going to be too late. I would propose three uh, amendments or four amendments under the purpose, uh, number one in the, uh, in the program, uh, we, we state explicitly this is a one-year pilot. Um, number two, we replace in section three, we replace first come first serve with lottery. Um, and lotteries, I mean, people run lotteries all the time, school districts, all sorts of things. And it uh, doesn't have to have the same kind of um, outcome as um, what you went through, Rick, um, back in the day. Um, the third uh, amendment is uh, I'm uncomfortable with the notion of disputes not being able to be brought to the board. I mean, that's part of the petition, the, you know, your, your representatives for redress. So I would uh, add in that the, uh, it, that the person has the ability to appeal to the board. I believe we have that for, the, for other situations where there's a similar uh, financial uh, interests at stake. And uh, the fourth change would be to uh, strike Section 10 in its entirety. Okay. Well, and just to be very clear, I would like to see a program work. I just want to make sure it works well for everybody involved. Right. Okay. Uh, Lou, you're at the top of my list. Do you have a comment or a question? Lou? Lou, you disappeared. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Lou. Good. I'm having troubles with my computer right now. It's saying network bandwidth is low, so I've turned off my video and hopefully I'll be able to at least maintain my audio. <clears throat> the question I have uh, for the Lira program is the, the, the revenue source for the $25,000 is the cell tower rental fees that we collect. Is that correct? No, it doesn't look like it looks it, like it's made up of a number of things, Lou. Stephanie, well, that, that's where is. we're taking the money from our expense line. Where is the revenue line coming from? Because we can't spend ratepayers' uh, fees. It is being funded by non rate revenue. So, since this is happening, I mean, Yes, I'm earmarking the the mobile lease revenue as being the the steady source of non-rate revenue that we can essentially bank on for years to come if we wanted to continue this program annually. The since this happened after the budget, this twenty five thousand dollar essentially credit your to revenue offset to revenue would cause us to have a reduction in overall. Reserves. So we had about sixty thousand dollars that was going to be going into reserves based off of this budget. This would cause it to be twenty five grand less. So the way that the committee proposed that we do it is that they didn't want to reduce the amount of reserves that the district had going into this next year's budget. And so the way to offset it would be to reduce operating expenses for this year. Then on the ongoing basis, if this program was desired to be continued, it would simply become part of the budget process to where, you know, if we expected a million dollars in revenue, but we were going to be offering a $25,000 credit program, then we would be having, you know, $975,000 in revenue coming in. And however it shook out and, you know, the, the rest of the stuff, it would just be what it is versus right now it happened after the budget. Yeah, I understand all that. I just want to make sure, and Gina, help me. We have to be clear that we're not using ratepayer dollars for this Lyra program, correct? Uh, correct. And um, that's uh, what I had my hand up to address. It, it is important 
that the program not be funded by rate revenue, and that is set forth in the program or in the uh, in the policy document. Um, and Stephanie has assured us that the district has adequate non-rate revenue um, to cover the $25,000 commitment. So um, legally speaking, uh, no particular district revenue is tied to this program, but there is an exclusion that prevents non that prevents rate revenue from being applied to it. Money is fungible. Anything else, Lou? No, thank you. Okay, uh, Lois, you had another comment. I do. I have to totally disagree with the idea that people wanting to participate in this program come to the board to present their case. I, I can't imagine anybody really wanting to do that. It's kind of like the big brouhaha that happens when somebody says, oh, well, I didn't know I had a water leak and it's a huge amount and you're only giving me half off. I want to go to the board and change it. That doesn't ever work out well. So I, I have to disagree with that. Uh, that say somewhere that, are you saying each applicant has to come before the board? I don't think that's written in there. In this no, it's not. No, Director Fultz said he wanted people to be able to come to the board right, look, and give their case. Steve, if I may. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Well, not, not precisely. And if it wasn't clear, I'll see if I can make it clear. So this had to do with Section 9, which has to deal with disputes. Um, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with the notion if we get into a dispute that uh, the board members uh, or that the, the, the public member, the community, the customer, the ratepayer, the voter has no ability to come to the board to present their case around the dispute. We have, that's, we have that circumstance with leak policy today that if someone wants to bring it to the board, they can do so. Um, and I'm, I, I just think as a matter of public policy, the, the people that are responsible to the voters, that being the five of us, need to make sure that we're available to deal with those kinds of things if it can't be resolved uh, between them and the, and the district manager. Um, that is our obligation, is to take care of uh, the community that may have uh, grievances they want redressed. Well, okay. Thank you, Bob. I disagree, but uh, Rick, you want to clarify a point? Well, the way my, my thoughts are on this is that anybody can come to the board for any reason at any time. Regardless if you say the, the district manager or finance manager has the final say, anybody can come and address the board. And that's the way it should be. I would not recommend we make it an easy avenue or a procedure to bring such things to the board because it will tie up a considerable amount of the board's time and there's a time and a place to review policies and just like we do with leaks and other things the board does have a difficulty dealing with certain policies um, not saying that they shouldn't uh, if there's a, an increase in issues, if five people come to the board uh, complaining about our leak policy, or even two or three, most likely the board would take it up. I, I just don't want to make it an easy avenue, a part of the procedure to bring it, you know, you got my step to the district manager, then if you don't like it, the district manager says you can bring it to the board. I think it'll take up a lot of your time. I think it's unnecessary. Um, Anybody can go to the board at any time. They can pick up the phone anytime. They can send you an email anytime. Um, we would never preclude anybody from coming to the board, but I, I just don't think it, it's a good idea to make it part of the procedure. But I can go either way, obviously. Thank you, Rick. I agree with you. Gina, you have a, another something to donate here? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, President Swan. I just wanted to comment that 
if the board decides to adopt the resolution and policy um, presented here in the packet, there is one tweak that's needed, which is um, in section three of the policy, it has a blank launch date. So that would need to be specified in any motion um, to adopt the resolution to approving the policy. Um, regarding the other amendments to the policy that were proposed, uh, they create a number of issues that um, such that if the board wants to pursue those amendments, I, I would recommend that we bring this back at another meeting where we can talk about the consequences of some of those changes. Uh, would that so if there were if the only change were to simply adopt the lottery policy as opposed to the first come first serve and say after 30, 30 days after announcing the existence of the policy or of the program and advertising and promoting it for those 30 days, if we said uh, within within 10 days after the end of the 30 days, all of the applicants would be then pulled and a lottery would be performed to pull out the 200 or whatever uh, candidates or lucky winners that can take advantage of the program. Well, th those changes are substantial enough that we would need to draft that and come back and talk about it. Okay. Staff needs time to discuss one of the one of the, the strong concerns staff had that we wanted to take district staff out of the process of picking who was going to receive um, you know the reduced rate or be part of this program. Okay. We we didn't want to have staff involvement, um, and that's where the Lira first come first serve worked out. So I'm not saying that we're against a, a lottery type system, but I think we need staff needs to have time to see what what that entails. Make sure we're comfortable with the checks and balances and so forth. Right. Well, we perhaps want the staff to make these decisions who was going to, to be part of the program. And I don't think they would be with the lottery system, but we'd want a, a time to, to review those changes. Yeah, and I second that. I, I'm, I'm not saying a lottery wouldn't work, but um, right. that language would need to be massaged and you know written and massaged and presented to the board. Okay, all right. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Bob, you have another uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, just final thought. I mean, uh, absolutely, lotteries, uh, and Rick, I, I understand your concern, and I, I share that, and I'm sure there's a way we can structure a lottery if we wanted to go down that where staff uh, is not involved in that. And, and second of all, with respect to Section 9, if, if in fact the, the intent is that anybody can come to the board at any time, then we shouldn't be saying things uh, in, that, that make it seem like it's a finality. So rather than say anything at all, we could just strike that because clearly, Rick, you know, we're we're not here to try to make it easy, but um, we do want to make sure that we're here for those people that wish to pursue it, you know, as is their right to do so. I agree. I mean, anybody should be able to go to the board at any time. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, all right. Well, we've come to that point in our program where. Uh, the directors have an opportunity to make a motion. Anybody want to make a motion regarding this resolution? So um, I don't know if, how I can word this into a motion, but what I what I'm hearing, all right, is that um, we need some time to uh, double check about this lottery and to include the pilot program. Uh, striking the tenth clause, but keeping nine, or striking both nine and ten, um, you know, that seems to be a little bit of a question. So if it takes, you know, I'd, I'd rather get this right. Um, if it takes taking it back to a committee one more time to uh, double check about this lottery system and to strike the word pilot in it, um, maybe that's the that's the course that I would recommend. Um, okay, I'll just stop there. Uh, Rick, Rogers. Uh, I would just recommend, I don't think we need a motion. I think you can just direct staff and Gina help me out to go back to the budget and finance and try to incorporate those recommendations. Or do you want a motion, Gina? Well, um, if it's going back to committee, then we don't need a motion because the committee can provide direction. 
Um, but if the board were to want to have the policy brought back to them, then a motion of some sort would be helpful so that we know what types of changes the board wants okay. to incorporate. Okay. Rick, you have another question? No, I'm, uh, this Rick, no, I'm good. I'm, I'll just wait for your direction then. I can go, either, we staff can go either way, but we okay. do want time to look into those those changes and. Um, well, let me, okay, let me ask the other, I, I'm frankly, I mean, based on the way Gina's explained it, um, you know, it's, it, it's essentially a one year program, call it a pilot, call it a, anything you want. It's funded for one year. So going back to put the word pilot in there seems kind of unnecessary. Uh, I do think the lottery kind of has some advantages, but I also think because it is a pilot and we're only doing it for 200 people maximum anyway, um, I don't know that we really need to adopt a lottery system and put that extra burden on people and have people uh, uh, raise issues about that. You know, it's a, it's $25,000. It's a small amount that we're offering. And I th think we're, really investing a great deal of time in this that I don't think really needs to be there, but that's just my opinion. Um, I see, uh, Lois, you have a question or a comment? Well, if it goes back to committee, it's just more delay. And I mean, certainly it can go to the budget and finance committee again, but we already uh, suggested what we wanted and Director Fultz was part of that committee uh, and none of those kind of, he didn't bring up any of that at that time. So I, I, don't, I don't see what we're accomplishing by going back to committee. I tend to agree with you, Lois. That's where I was going with this. Would you like to make a motion, Lois? And we'll see where the other directors sit on this. Okay, I can make a motion. Um, first of all, I gotta find it. All right. Um, I would like to suggest uh, a resolution to approve uh, resolution number 25, 1920, establishing a rate assistant program for eligible customers. And um, Director Henry, in conjunction with your motion, um, would you establish a launch date for the program to be written into the policy? A launch date. Um, well, what about um, the first board meeting in in uh, July? Or we only have one board meeting in July. May I may I just interrupt for a second and ask the director of finance? I do believe she had a launch date in mind. Oh, okay. Um, that maybe she would provide. Stephanie? Yeah, so it'll kind of depend on if you guys want to do advertising in advance of the forms and everything being available. Um, that's kind of the only, you know, we're ready. I can have the form available on the website starting July 1st. Um, it can be advertised and go that way. If we wanted to advertise ahead of everything, um, before making the form available to the public, that way people can start to get ready. We can have it be August 1st, but I mean, essentially we can, we can sit here and turn it on. Um, you know, it's one of those things. It's a great, it, we don't know exactly how it's going to happen. You know, some places don't have it fill up right away. Some places, you know, it took them a year and a half before they hit their max. We just don't really know what, what to necessarily expect, but we are prepared for a July 1st if the board did want to move that quickly. Stephanie, how about July 15th? That gives July us fifteenth four, work gives us four weeks of advertising potential, or notice notice rather. Yeah, ju mm -hmm. July fifteenth would be fine. Okay. So, am I muted or not? No, no, you're not muted. 
Okay, so that's, you want me to include that in the motion, a start date of July 15th. Right. Right? Thank you, Lewis. I'll second that. All right. Uh, Director Fultz, you have a comment? I have a question. Um, the letter to the uh, state legislature, uh, is that going to be voted on separately? District Council, that's listed as supplemental, and I thought we would take that separate. Is yeah, it's part of this agenda item, but it probably makes sense to have a separate discussion and motion for that portion of the item. That would be great. I would, I would like to see that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Holly, would you like to record the votes? Director Moran? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Fulce? No. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Director Ferris? Is he muted? Are you, um, can you hear us, Lou? He's muted. He's muted. Unmute yourself, Lou. No, I think, did he disappear? He's gone now. He's gone. Well, we have three yeses, so the motion passes. Okay. Council, do you have any comments or any concerns? Well, um, I would recommend that we move on to the discussion about the letter and um, call the vote again uh, once Director Ferris is able to join. Um, since his, he obviously okay. intended to be here and participate. But even if he does, it, it doesn't, it makes no difference to the vote, correct? Um, it's well, important he'd be allowed to vote. Yeah, it's important that he be allowed to vote. So I, I think we should revisit the vote, call it again when he dials back in. Okay. Well, if we're gonna wait for that, then we should wait for him to hear the discussion on the next item, right? Well, I do believe we're gonna do the discussion on uh, the supplemental 5A, right. um, on the uh, low income rate assistance uh, uh, letter of uh, support for AB 401, is that correct, Dina? Was your recommendation? That's right. Okay. And I'll ask district council to uh, present that. Okay, and I, I will momentarily, it looks like we just got Director Ferris back. Um, I, I, am, I am here, I apologize. Okay. Um, Chair Swan, uh, would, would it be all right to ask uh, the district secretary to call the vote again now? Yes. Before we move sure. on? Absolutely, Holly, go ahead and uh, let's deja vu us ourselves. Call the vote again. Okay, uh, Director Moran? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Fulce? No. Director Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. Motion passes. Thanks very much for, for bearing with that. Um, okay, so uh, the district manager asked me to discuss the uh, portion of this agenda item, which is the draft letter to uh, the state assembly regarding AB 401. Um, and if you haven't seen the letter, it was circulated, I believe on Tuesday or Wednesday after the agenda went out and it's available on the district's website right under the agenda. Um, the general content of the letter is that it encourages members of the assembly to uh, implement the state board's recommendations that are set forth. And let me, let me back up and give a little background here for those who may not be familiar with it. What AB 401 did was it required state agencies, including the state water board, to um, study uh, 
how to create a rate assist a water rate assistance program to help low in income Californians with water bills. And the state board produced its report that was required under AB 401 in February of this year. So that report um, covers a lot of ground and um, they considered a lot of different ways to structure a, a statewide rate assistance program. Um, what they came up with were recommendations for kind of three program components. One would be uh, a, a water bill credit, a direct water bill credit. One is a renter's water credit that folks who rent and don't pay water bills directly could take advantage of. And another is a crisis assistance for folks who have um, a, an urgent short-term need to help keep their water on. Um, and I guess some highlights of the report that are important to an agency like the district is that the state board's report recognizes that local agencies like the district have difficulty implementing LIRA programs uh, for a lot of the reasons that were discussed by the board and the public in connection with this agenda item. One of the, the reasons it's difficult is Prop 218, which prevents subsidizing the water rates of low income um, individuals or households with increased water rates on higher income households. Um, another is just the burden that it would create on some small water systems where many members of the community need some kind of rate assistance. And they're just, it just, you know, the burdens can't be spread around in any way that would be uh, fair or sustainable. So uh, the report recommends that the state adopt a statewide program funded um, by some new taxes. Um, and this is something that's been talked about at the state policy level for a long time, but the state board report really goes into detail about how it could work. Um, and I think it's fair to say from the district, district's perspective, now is the time to do something like this. Uh, I mean, aside from the uh, difficulties that some uh, members of the, uh, of the district's community in California face um, in terms of increased cost of living and so on, um, COVID has really brought this issue into focus and made financial assistance more urgent for some folks. So uh, the district prepared a letter urging members of the state assembly to, to move forward with implementing the state board's recommendations in the AB 401 report. Um, you will notice in the draft letter that the addressees are bracketed and um, in italics. And the reason for that is that um, typically a letter like this would be addressed to the members of a committee that's actually considering pending legislation. But as far as we can tell, there is no legislation pending right now. And so I've teed up this letter to go to all the members of the committees, the assembly committees that passed the original um, AB 401. Um, that may or may not be the, mo the, the best way to address something like this. I mean, who, the, who we really want to get this is a, an assembly member or a state senator who would actually um, sponsor legislation related to AB 401, but in the absence of you know, knowing who would be willing to take up the charge on that, um, that issue, we simply addressed it to all the members of the committee that passed the original um, AB 401 and uh, copied it to the local assemblyman, Mark Stone, and the state water board point of contact who um, is listed for the AB 401 report. But if there are other ideas as to you know, who this might be addressed to, who might be willing to take up the cause on uh, implementing the state board's recommendations, um, those suggestions would be very welcome. Thank you, Gina. Do we have any questions or comments that Gina can help address from anyone on the board? No. Okay. I think we're probably kind of the flea on an elephant's back sending a letter to anybody about anything about this, especially since it's not even looking you know, to get voted on. Uh, anybody have any questions? Bob, I saw your hand come and go. Are you passing? No, I, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we absolutely need to do. And if anything, you know, Gina, it might be it might be 
more mild than what what I think um, the situation calls for because um, the the situation around cost of living for um, uh, people of lower incomes in the state of California is is dire. I mean, it is, uh, in my opinion, approaching a real crisis situations when we have um, you know uh, a third of our community um, living on gross income of fifty to sixty thousand dollars. And the kind of rate increases that we're likely to see, um, uh, certainly, you know, advancing at multiples of inflation. Um, you know, when you start spending a, a couple of percent of your gross income on uh, water, uh, this is recognized as a massive disaster of the first order. And so, um, I, I, I think, I, I think you're very diplomatically worded it, but to me, this, this. The urgency of finding a at scale statewide solution that that treats small districts like ours with the kind of um, attention that we need, and not all the attention going to East Bay mud, um, is is just as urgent as it possibly can be. So, um, if this is the letter that goes out, it's the one that goes out. But I I, I think it is it, the situation is more dire than we're saying. Bob, anybody else have any uh, questions or comments on the board? <laughs> well, where did that go? Lois, I'll pretend I saw your hand if you have something. Okay, to thanks. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I realize right now the state has a lot going on. And I think beating up on them wouldn't really help. And I've had some talks with Mark Stone's um, aide. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's kind of like we're having a hard time, too. Because getting business done with this virus, it's, it's limiting. It, it takes time. Uh, I like the letter. I think it's a good letter, and I'm I support uh, the letter myself. Okay, thank you, Lois. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Ro uh, Rick? Just Roger? At this point, I've, I've spoken to the other water district managers uh, in the county, and there is a. Uh, a strong desire to send letters from each of the districts as well. Mm, okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from any of the directors or staff? Okay, let's go to our attendees. Do we have any uh, public questions or comments about the letter? Okay, I don't see any. Okay, back to us. Anybody want to make a motion? There is no motion coming forward about the letter. Oh my gosh, do I have to make the motion again? Uh, are you feeling overworked, Lois? <laughs> Earn your pay. I've Earn only pay. begun to. Where in the world did I? Oh. Where'd you put okay. your hand? I don't have to put my hand up. All right. Uh, well, we. I don't have a motion number, right? Can I just move that we agree to send this letter to the state legislature? Gina, is that okay? Yes, that motion works. Okay. That was my motion. Thanks, Lois. Anybody want to second it? Okay. I'll, I'll second the motion. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, Director Moran seconds it. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Director Moran? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Fulce? Yes. President Swan? Yes. 
Director Ferris. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And uh, I believe for those in attendance that have not seen the letter or would like an opportunity to see the letter, I'm, it is on the website. Correct, Holly? Correct. Okay. So we'll just pretend I read your minds. Okay. Well, that wasn't too bad. A trip to the dentist. Now, uh, back to you, General Rogers. Okay. Uh, uh, item uh, strategic plan. Uh, it's recommended that the board directors review this memo and give direction uh, regarding the district strategic plan and governance training workshop. Uh, the district has been working on updating the strategic plan to facilitate, uh, facilitate updating the strategic plan the district <laughs> Engage the services of manager and partners, Greg uh, Larson. On October 17, 2019, the board directed, uh, agreed to have directors Fultz and Harris work together in a draft plan for board and public review. Uh, on June 1st, Director Henry requested this item be placed on the agenda uh, for updating. Uh, the district has also contracted the services of MRG, uh, Amy uh, Hopworth to provide the board with governance training, working on contentious issues, which could be useful in moving the strategic plan forward. The district has scheduled a workshop that had to be canceled due to COVID-19 uh, with managing or with MRG. Uh, moving forward, staff is looking for direction in, in completing the governance training and whether to hold a, a video conference or to wait until an in-person meeting could be facilitated uh, following county health guidelines for public assembly. Staff is looking for direction on moving forward. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to Chair Swan. Okay. Um, Lois, you have a comment or I do. That's, I asked for the, thank you, uh, President Swan, uh, because I asked for this to be on the agenda. And the reason I did was because Stephanie has many times requested that we get moving with the strategic plan so she has a guide uh, on how to do the budget. And just recently, a member of the public asked me if it was possible to have a multi-year budget as Director Fultz had suggested in an interview with the press banner. And I told him, yes, of course, but we need a strategic plan if we want multi-year budgets. Budgets are basically our best guesstimate based on history and our plans for the future. We live in a very volatile area. I've lived here 49 years this month. I have seen snow that has taken down a million trees, floods that have killed people, an earthquake that caused tremendous damage and death. And now guess what, we've got the virus. Um, so budgets are not written in stone, but we need direction for budgets if we're gonna do multi-year budgets. Now, Previous, the previous board, let me give you a little history here. The previous board had a strategic plan, but the current board found that plan to be cumbersome and way too long. We didn't want to spend the money on a professional to write the plan. So the board voted to have Director Fultz and the district manager work together and write a draft strategic plan. What happened was Director Fultz wrote a draft strategic plan not involving the district manager. His plan was placed on the agenda and resulted in a 
big protest from members of the public, not all members, but a lot, I'd say the majority of the people who came to the meeting protested and some board members also had issues. Next, the board in all its wisdom voted to have directors Fultz and Ferris write the strategic plan. What were we thinking? That was never going to work and it didn't. I don't believe a board member should write a strategic plan without input from staff and the public. We are a government agency, not a private business. Also, if you check around, you will find that most special districts don't have a board member write a strategic plan or even policy for that matter. We of course have a chance to say what we want and power to vote. And it is our responsibility to approve policy. Now, originally the board voted to have the district manager involved in writing the draft strategic plan, but that didn't happen. So what do we do? Now the board did vote on a very long list of goals and objectives for the district manager. I believe that the district manager using those goals and objectives could come up with a draft strategic plan. I would like to make a motion that the board direct the district manager to prepare a draft strategic plan based on his goals and objectives established by the board of directors. Thank you, Lewis. I think that was fabulous. So that's a motion that you're teeing up, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, before I second that, which I will, do we have any other uh, comment from any uh, of the directors at this point? Uh, yes, Steve. Okay. Well, well, let's see. So Bob had the blue hand and, and Rick, you had the white hand come up. So uh, since you're on the screen, I'm going to go to you first right now. And okay. Give you your opportunity to share your thoughts. Uh, so I, you know, I understand Lois's history of this. Thank you very much for uh, encapsulating that, Lois. Um, but one of the other components of that was there was some um, contentiousness that was expressed at those uh, first meetings talking about the strategic plan. And um, I suggested uh, that we um, receive some training um, uh, governance training from a consultant, uh, MRG, uh, particularly Amy Haworth. Um, and that's the path that we were on, is to receive some of that training. And because it's not only what we do, it's how we do it. And um, I've been the target of um, unfair criticism and I didn't want to see that happen anymore. And here, the grand jury had recommended that we get this training, and this was a perfect time to do that. Unfortunately, um, this COVID crisis has delayed that process. We had one meeting with that governance training consultant uh, just before the COVID started. Um, and we weren't able to continue that. Um, I would hope that we would, you know, if the uh, staff is looking for direction, that that would be the, uh, uh, it was the first step we wanted to do back in March and I, or February. And I still think it should be the first step we do before we go on to the strategic plan, because we need to avoid the contentiousness that uh, was evident at those first meetings. Um, and, so that, that is my uh, recommendation about this, that I unfortunately, not unfortunately, but I agree with you, the strategic plan is important, 
and uh, it needs to be done. And I know that Stephanie has a timeline that she'd like to achieve. Uh, some things have been thrown in our way, but we still need this training on contentious issues so that we produce something that is tolerable to the public when we do this. We cannot have contentious issues being uh, disruptive to the process that we're trying to do here. Thank you. Steve, could I say something? Um, well, actually, Lois, you have to hold off now because uh, another director's got their hand up, so you'll get to your turn. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Bob? Well, I, uh, I appreciate Lois's comments, but I really got to correct something that she stated as a fact in her introductory remarks. Um, there was no bo board vote <clears throat> on me working with uh, the district manager on coming up with a strategic plan. I volunteered to write a draft for the board that the board could use, throw out, do whatever they wanted. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, and I um, talked to a lot of people uh, during that process. So to say that <clears throat> that was something that the board directed uh, to have happen and it never happened is just not true. Um, I am I am deeply disturbed by the notion that we should um, deviate from what we had agreed upon as the, a plan to bring the community into this process to the maximum extent possible as well. And in fact, the admin committee of which Lois serves recommended a process <laughs> that uh, I believe we're still going down with the insertion of what uh, Rick said we, we should do, which is to get this uh, contentious training um, uh, done first. Uh, and I still support that. Um, to do a process that does not involve the community being able to provide input into the drafting process is astounding. Um, uh, Lou and I have, have worked on the plan. We are um, have have made a tremendous amount of progress in, um, uh, I think, working through some of the uh, comments that were made during the uh, debate and discussion around it. Uh, I think this will be a very um, good process. I think it'll be a model for uh, what boards can do uh, to bring forth the policies that the community wants to see and by community, it's the broad community, including the voters who uh, vote in each election, want to see as part of their district's policies. So um, I would uh, not support uh, this process of short-circuiting the community from being involved. Thank you, Bob. Lois, back to you. Okay. For one thing, I was going to also, after we dealt with one thing, to mention that we need to do the governance training as soon as possible. But I was trying to deal with one thing at a time. The other thing is, <clears throat> I was board president in 2019. I know what went on. The board did vote to have the district manager and Bob Fultz write a plan. I, I guess, well, the district manager, I'm not going to put him on the spot, but he might have to get on it. Uh, the other thing is that there is contentious um, issues. And when Bob says he and Lou are on the verge of coming up with a plan, uh-uh. They've had a lot of time. They haven't come up with a plan. They haven't been able to agree. And again, I, I leave that. I'm going to have to leave that to Lou to talk about. But I just want to get things done. We dilly dally around here, and there's so much to be done. And yes, I want the government's 
governance training as much as you do, Rick Moran. Thank you, Liz. Okay, uh, Bob, you have a, your hand up. Yeah, I'll be happy to bring the facts regarding the action that was done uh, to demonstrate that there was no vote taken as uh, Director Henry states. That's no problem at all. Um, you know, everybody can have an opinion, but uh, there's only one set of facts. Um, I, I would uh, support, though, the notion of moving forward uh, with this contentious training um, via conference. Uh, at this point, I don't exactly know when we're going to be able to do something in person. And while it is not optimal to do it in this fashion, and we might want to um, consult with uh, uh, Amy on that to see what she would say on it. I think moving forward on it would be um, would be really good. Um, the 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 agreement that we had as part of that is that we would have that training first, and then uh, Lou and I would bring the draft back to the board after that for consideration and for putting it through the community process. There, there is no, and so given that there is a delay of the training, there is necessarily a delay in the bringing that back. Um, so I still think that that is the best process to do. And as, as we had originally uh, agreed on, we would bring that draft back as part of the discussions with the community, which would be the next step in the process. Again, short circuiting this process is um, I don't believe in the best interest of the community, uh, the ratepayers, or the people that are interested in this district moving forward. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, I'm not sure that the uh, perpetual delays that we're providing the community are doing them any good either. Uh, Rick Rogers, you have your hand up. On um, on the contentious training, I have been in, in discussion with Amy and uh, spoke to district council about how we could move forward. I spoke to some of the directors um, and they, what I'm getting is that directors would like a face-to-face -face meeting versus a visual video meeting. Um, one process to move this forward would be that the board could meet in the operations building practice social distancing, um, but not allow the public to enter the building and broadcast the whole meeting, you know, via either community TV or, you know, one of the, uh, the media outlets and allow questions and so forth, just like we're doing this board meeting, but the public wouldn't be in the building. We just don't have the room and then to practice social distancing. So the board could meet if so desired for a face-to-face -face meeting uh, and we would broadcast live. Um, I, I don't know if council wants to add to that, if that's, if she's got any concerns with that, but that I do believe that would be in compliance today with the Brown Act. Yeah, and, and, and as we discussed, um, I mean, none of this is ideal, but um, giving the board members the option if they're comfortable to meet in person I think would maximize the value of the training um, while also you know, being as protective as possible as health and safety in terms of minimizing the number of people who are together in one place. Or we could have, we could move ahead to training just like this, a meeting like this. Um, not ideal, I think you lose something by not being in person on, on this kind of training um, and discussion. Um, but those are, I think, our two possibilities at this time or put it off until, you know, the California opens up on what stage three or, or whatever that is. And that, who knows when that's going to be. I think that would just be kicking the can down the road further. I will never get it done. Um, I didn't think it was gonna go this long once we canceled, I thought it would be short lived and we'd be back to our regular meeting type goals and schedules, but it's not happening. So I have a question for you. So would Amy be in person there? She would be. She would drive up. She would drive up. Okay. And she, she will have no problem with driving up. She's, uh, she's from I Los Angeles. The only one that would be, I think council, district council would be 
um, video. Am I right, Gina? Uh, that's right. Yeah. But the rest of the full board and the district manager would be there in person. That's just a proposal now. I don't know how the board feels about that. Um, I think we can easily provide, you know, the six foot distancing, you know, mask, whatever, the disinfection, and you know, we can clean before, during, and after the meeting or, you know, however. So be follow, you know, we have protocol for meeting, um, which is in compliance with the, the county recommendations. Um, so we could do that and put the board in the room and, uh, <clears throat> and it would be live and, and you would have, you know, the audience would be able to ask questions just like they're doing now, at, you know, at, at certain times of the meeting when called on by the chair. So this would be the training about how to deal with contentious topics. This would not be a meeting that would address producing the strategic plan. No, it would not. Right. So, uh, you know, let me ask uh, uh, Stephanie a question. Stephanie, how much further or longer do you think we can wait without having a strategic plan before we can, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrase, get our ship together? I mean, it's difficult. I mean, we talked about this over a year ago when we were going through the last budget process. Yeah, you know, the strategic plan, the strategic plan is the backbone to developing some of these other major initiatives and plans that we have in the pipeline. So getting them all to tie together is key. So, I mean, we really need to get moving on the strategic plan, in my opinion. Right. And how many Steve, I would like to weigh in. How many successful plans do we see coming out of committees versus, you know, the alternative? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lou. You didn't have yes, I would like to weigh in, please. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. First of all, I'd like to um, agree with Director Fultz that I find some of what Lois was saying to be factually inaccurate. But uh, I think that aside, the, the real issue is moving strategic planning forward. And I agree with Stephanie that it is imperative that we get this done and, in my opinion, get this done by the end of the year. This will allow for coordination with water master plan, thereby providing district department heads their critical planning information to lay out appropriate tactical goals for 2021. My second comment is in regards to my inability to provide effective leadership in moving the strategic planning process forward these past eight months. While I believe Bob and I have made progress in meeting three times and revising the draft plan each time, we are still not within reach of a final draft that will pass muster. This makes me wonder if we can complete the task by year's end. Year's end. Further, there are two more options I do not recommend for getting the job done along, along the lines of strategic planning. Um, the first is that we go back to the last finalized strategic plan from 2016, using it as some have suggested for forward planning. This plan is out of date. It is a bureaucratic behemoth and it is a formula for veering off course. I base this on the fact that approximately 80% of the goals set forth in that plan are woefully behind their projected due dates. Lastly, I do not recommend using a consultant going forward. While this was a reasonable approach last year when proposed, I believe it no longer feasible. The costs will be substantial in consulting fees, which are not in the budget, and more importantly, it will require taking a step backward to bring the consultant up to speed as an effective moderator. I believe a finalized strategic plan would therefore not be ready by year's end. This brings me to what I do recommend. I believe finalizing the strategic plan should be placed in the hands of a single person. This person must have an innate vision of where the district should be in five years based on a comprehensive understanding of the district's inner workings. Further, this person must be versed in long range planning and be able to work on an abbreviated timeline. I believe this person should be district manager Rick Rogers. He is eminently qualified to see the big picture and is armed with long range goals, which this board approved last fall. Therefore, I move that the board direct the district manager, Rick Rogers, to come up with a revised draft of the strategic plan using the last approved plan from 2016 and Bob's draft from 2019. 
Further, the resulting draft should be part of the board agenda packet, the second meeting in August. And after comments from the public staff and board are reviewed at the second board meeting in September, a strategic plan hopefully can be submitted and approved the second meeting in October. This will allow for marrying the strategic plan with the master water plan in November. If all goes well, optimal tactical goals for 2021 will be possible. QED. Thank you, Lou. And you even included a timeline. That's terrific. I like that. Uh, okay, Lois, your blue hand was first, I think, or it's the first one I saw. So, oh, your turn. There's, or no, oh, I I'm sorry, I failed. Never to put it down, up. did you? Put my hand down, seeing as how I'm being branded as. Never mind. Your Doesn't hand. pay to be vulnerable, I guess. Your, your hand is still up, Lois. Well, I clicked on it. Uh, we'll pretend I don't see it. Okay. okay. Any other uh, comments? Okay. I, Lois, you keep I, okay. you're waving it's now. You're, not, you're just it's waving. Gone. Stop it's waving. Gone. Stop touching your keyboard. Okay. Uh, I, I th Lou, I love your uh, your suggestion, and uh, I uh, and I believe that's in some ways very similar to what Lois was suggesting as well. I would, uh, well, I like it a lot. Do we have any other comments before we let the public weigh in on uh, the sub subject matter? We have someone in the public with a quick comment. We'll go to them. Mark Lee, Thank share you. your thoughts. Thank you, President. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, comment that uh, we elected certain officials in the last election. There are our representatives. There are directors that we voted directly for based on their expertise in business and government. Uh, you know who they are. And we expect them to represent us in when they were developing, especially in developing a strategic plan. I'm not sure it's a good idea to go back to the 2016 Brian Lee regime. Uh, that was kind of disastrous. I would like to see us move forward with the Bob Fultz, the director Bob Fultz and uh, um, director uh, Lou Ferris's uh, plan is a, is a boilerplate to work from. And I think that the timelines that uh, director Ferris's outlined are, are, are plausible and, and realistic. But I do think we cannot move forward without having public input perhaps public meetings online to get their input. And we need to have a, a strong lead time to review a draft. I'm not sure that the general manager, Rick Rogers has the time to do all this himself. So I, I propose that we still use the existing uh, troika of director Fultz and director Ferris working with the general manager to hammer out a basic strategic plan that we can look at as a public and make comments on and then proceed uh, with public uh, public hearings and then back to Lou Ferris's timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, so we have a, um, we have Lois and Lou both making similar suggestions on direction. Um, I'm I'll uh, second Lou's motion. Uh, President Swan, we have another member of the public who would like to comment. Oh, we do. Sorry, Beth Thomas. You are free to roam. Okay. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I I have grave concerns about um I, no matter who the person is, having one person put together a strategic plan, uh, I, I, I do agree with uh, Mark Lee's comment that, you know, I, I feel like this board has done a lot to try to move beyond some of the contentiousness. And I think that that is appreciated as a member of the community. I can say that I think that it's a sign of at least goodwill. Um, but with respect to the strategic plan, 
there is not just contentiousness amongst the people on the board. Um, there is contentiousness about this issue in the community as well. And I think you can expect that. So I, I agree that there needs to be some well thought out way to include the community um, in giving feedback. Uh, it's going to have to be in a different format, which I don't know, maybe is a positive thing <laughs> given the contentiousness issue. Um, and I think the board's going to have to have a meaningful way to respond to that. Uh, but I do think that uh, I think that the board that the board is elected by the community and the board has some responsibility to be a part of this process of strategic planning. Um, I do think that the people who do the work always have a strong uh, part in saying what uh, that work needs to be. And I would agree that having uh, Rick Rogers and the and the board members who are who have currently been tasked with it to complete the uh, the proposed um, strategic plan and then put it on the agenda and then find a way for meaningful community input will prevent some more contentiousness. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Lee Summers. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, well, I, I've, um, my understanding, I want to try to get a little bit of clarity about this. So I understand that there's the old 2016 strategic plan, which is no longer viable. Then um, Director Foltz wrote one last year and it kind of got bogged down. Uh, Director Ferris um, joined in and started to kind of um, come up with a, a, another uh, or, or kind of make some changes, but that's kind of stalled out. And what I'm hearing this evening is that Director Henry is suggesting that staff make the make a uh, a new develop a new plan, and then Director Ferris saying that Rick Rogers be the one person, and um, that that would that would basically compile a plan based on the the previous work that's been done. And it sounds like this is a contentious enough issue that um, to have one neutral person, and I think Rick Rogers is a very is a, a very neutral person and be an excellent uh, selection to take the current ideas that have been already laid down and compile them into a, a, a draft plan that can be moved forward. And I support uh, Director Ferris's uh, suggestion, and I would like to see it move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, Larry, is that, is that you, Larry Ford? Yes, thank you. Uh -huh. I'd, I'd like to uh, second what Lee Summers just said. Um, I think Lou Ferris, who's extremely experienced in this kind of thing, um, would have a lot of advice to give. I think Bob Fultz has already given his advice and we have a whole a whole draft of a strategic plan that he prepared. I think that Rick Rogers would be the perfect person to do that. And uh, I don't think that he's going to object to that. I think he can make time to work on this. And uh, I think also that we do need to figure out a way to get the uh, contentious issue training in before a community meeting. Hopefully that can be done in July, and then in in August there can be some kind of a community meeting itself. I I think it's going to continue to be a really hot topic, and so uh, I think it needs to be planned out sequentially like that in an efficient way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Larry. Whoops. Yep. Okay. Great. Any other uh, comments from the public? Okay. Uh, oh, let's, do I want to recognize Director, I mean, Mr. Rogers? Yes, I guess I will. Rick? Yeah, I think I'm on mute. You are now, Rick. You're on mute now. Yeah, okay. Um, just to kind of clarify a little bit of what that process would be. First off, 
just because a sign of the district manager, the district manager wouldn't be the sole person. The district manager, I would bring in the management team. And I believe that the plan that Director Fultz and, and Director Ferris have been working on, um, district staff would take and bring together and bring it back. I think by having staff do it, it would be less contentious because we are not political for one. Um, and I feel that we could take that plan that's, that sounds like it's pretty close to being completed and put it together and bring it back. We would never want to bring it or try to get something through that didn't have public review and plenty of ample time for the public. That's, that's the process. I strongly believe in public process on the strategic plan. Um, but I think staff could move this along um, and bring it back and, and it would look probably very close to what the two directors have been working on. Um, and we, uh, I spoke with uh, some of my key staff and we feel we could make these timelines. We could have this wrapped up by the end of the year um, very easily because you know we, we feel that we're almost there. And it's, we also feel that it's very important to get this document you know, back to the board and approved. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Lois, uh, is your hand really up or? Yes, my hand's really up. Oh, okay. Actually, I, I could second Rick's motion. I mean, lose. I'm sorry, lose motion. It's essentially what I said. Yes. To You're use... Right. The district manager and the board has already approved a whole long list of things. And so it would come with district approval. So I can second uh, Lou's proposal. I, I can withdraw mine and second his, but they're basically the same thing. I guess I'm in a totally different meeting than everybody else. Well, we don't need to vote on this, do we? Isn't this just providing direction to? Um, well, it doesn't technically require a vote. However, because there have been votes providing in the past, providing different direction, I think it would be good to have a motion. I, I'd recommend, frankly, a, a fairly simple streamlined motion uh, directing who is supposed to write it and perhaps a general timeline when the draft will be brought back for board and public review. If the two directors who have motions pending don't object to, you know, restating the motion in that way, I, I think that would be helpful. Okay, let's ask Lou, since he had a timeline associated with his... Uh... Yeah, I uh, thank you, Steve. I think that uh, that the motion I put forth um, addresses all of the 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 issues that Gina was just talking to. At least I think it does. Uh, I'd also like to add one more thing that, in terms of uh, Mark was asking about, uh, you know, Rick's involvement and what I didn't mention when I said we Bob and I had revised it three times. The third time, the last time we revised it was basically to get Rick's input and to add his long range goals into the strategic plan. So I agree with Bob, we are not that far from getting it across the goal line. I just feel that the best person to, to finish that job is Rick Rogers, um, not just because of what I said before, but also because he's got this calm demeanor and he's got credibility with the ratepayers. And I think, I'm a utilitarian, I just wanna get this done. And I think the best way to get this done in the shortest time frame possible is to hand the ball off to Rick Rogers. So for the, for the sake of an analogy, we'll call him Ezekiel Elliott. <laughs> and if you will rephrase your motion, Lou, I hope you had it written down. I do. Okay, please read it again. You are making the following motion. And then wait for a second. Okay, I wanna have to, I'm gonna have to modify this on the fly, but um, uh, I move that the board direct district manager Rick Rogers to come up with a revised draft of the strategic plan based on, and I'm gonna modify this too, ju the, the third revision that, that Bob and I did with uh, Rick's help uh, just not, not that long ago. Um, 
and that further the, the draft should be part of the board packet the second meeting in august in other words rick's got two months to come up with a hopefully a finalized strategic plan after that there will be a one month period for review by public staff and 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 the board again and then hopefully we can vote on and approve the strategic plan in october so it dove, dovetails well with the master water plan and creating tactical goals for 2021 is that good enough? I like it. Lois, you want to second that? Yes, I will. Okay, it's been seconded. Okay. Uh, can I have a little discussion, please? Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, so I like this motion as well. Um, and one of the things that it does that I think Director Fultz was trying to do when he presented a draft, and it was only a draft not a final document, um, is trying to reduce the reliance on consultants and the fees they charge, all right? So we've done that by doing this and having it done in-house, which is uh, one of the goals I think um, I support for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Holly, you still there? You're on mute. There you go. Director Moran? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Falls? Abstain. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Aye. Motion passes. Yes. So we've been to the dentist and then the proctologist, and now... Chair, Chair Kalani, if I, if I can, uh, while we're still on this item, can we talk again on the training on uh, contentious issues, on moving that forward? Um, does the board have a desire to direct staff on how they would like to uh, move forward on, on this training? Uh, would you, do you want a video meeting? Do you want, do you like the idea of an in-person meeting? Um, I, I agree that we need to move this ahead and I'd, I'd like a little direction. Okay. Uh, personally, I don't want to meet in person because I can't say that I would definitely be here. So I would have to opt for uh, uh, an option to include video uh, conferencing. Uh, I mean, if, if all the uh, rules and uh, the, the California went to stage whatever, uh, and you could all go back to normal. Yeah, I would. I would prefer to do it in person. But uh, barring that, then I would want the op option of having a video uh, uh, method enabled. That's my thought. And anybody else? I'll I'll chime in. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, I would support as soon as possible a video meeting. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So I'm hearing I'm hearing video meeting uh, unless not unless somebody else says you know video meeting is much easy to set up and to get all of you folks there um, if that's what the the direction is uh, staff will move ahead and uh, set up a video meeting and get this going. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Steve, if I may add something. Sure, certainly. Um, I I agree that we should we should pursue this uh, to completion as quickly as possible. Um, I would prefer to have it in person because I think you lose all of that that nonverbal communication when you try and do it uh, remotely. But I'm not against having a virtual meeting just to get it done. What I think is important, though, is that we decouple this contentious meeting with a strategic plan because otherwise you're going to slow down the strategic plan. I mean, I realized that we, we, we did this partly because we wanted to have that training for the strategic planning. But again, being a utilitarian, I don't want anything to get in the way of getting the strategic plan done by the end of the year. And I'm afraid this would have a possibility of doing that. I support that goal as well. I, I agree, keeping the two separate, uh, period. And the meeting, like I said, uh, and, until California goes to uh, back to normal, 
which may never happen. I would only support a, a video uh, meeting. As much as I'd like to be in person, uh, I'm not willing to risk anything to do okay, it. Staff, staff will move forward on a, on a video meeting, get this going. Bob, you had a comment? Bob, Director Fultz, question? I had a question. Um, what time frame were we talking about doing this in? I was going to, see it's a video meeting, I'll talk with well, Amy and well, get I, the dates. I, hang, on, hang on a sec. I'm not necessarily um, on board yet with only a video meeting. Um, but if we were having an in-person meeting, when would it be? Um, I haven't got back with her for, for dates. Um, and I would have to, we'd have to pull the board and find out when board availability was to get all five of you together. Uh, she'd probably be the easy one because she's not doing much right now. Um, but it would be the five board members uh, uh, to, to get some dates. We could put together some dates. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to explore an in-person meeting. Gina? Yeah, I just wanted to um, provide kind of a public service announcement that the uh, board and staff are not monitoring chat. So for members of the public who um, want to provide comments on uh, items that are pending before the board, please raise your hand during the public comment period um, so that everybody uh, gets the benefit of those comments. Thank you, Gina. Uh, <clears throat> do we have a public comment on our contentiousness training? No. Okay. So are we, uh, so I, I still don't have clarity yet. Are we talking about in-person or video only or mixed? I'm, I'm still waiting for that too. I, I, I hear both from the board. Speaking, I, I guess speaking, the, for, my, the speaking for myself, I, I will not participate in person unless everything is removed from the, uh, the state's uh, current shelter in place, mask, bullshit uh, concerns. So I will only be available via video at this point in time, unless unless uh, the the uh, the state of California directs otherwise. Yeah, well, and if I could just jump in here, um, there is adequate flexibility under the shelter in place orders um, to conduct this meeting in, in a number of different ways, um, consistent with public health guidelines. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't recommend that, you know, we try to require anybody to participate in person. There could be all kinds of reasons why that wouldn't be appropriate for an individual. Yeah, which is why I was asking about mixed, if we could do it mixed. Right. Well, I, I'd say yes off the top of my head. You, you know, I don't see why not. Um, um, we can probably can. We've done it before that way. It's just the the audio. I, I'm not quite sure how that'll that'll work, but we'll. I'm sure Bob, we can do it in this day and age. Well, let's ask Lou. Do you want mixed or do you want one or the other? I would prefer to have it mixed, but um, at this point, I think it's more important to just get it done and. Uh, I think whatever we lose by not being able to, to read body language, so be it. Uh, we can still have an effective session on cont on um, contentious issues with, with Amy um, remotely. Uh, I, I'm actually more concerned for, you know, Rick, do you, you know, since you're now going to be the, the, the man for strategic planning, you probably don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to set something up for contentious issues, right? I mean, I'd rather you do whatever is easiest for you in that regard so that you can spend your time on strategic planning. Well, you know, I want to move them both ahead. The, the, the contentious issue is easy. I'll just tell Holly to work on dates. <laughs> I mean, that's, a, that's an easy one, and she'll set that up. You know, the strategic okay. plan is, is the heavy lift. But, you know, we can move them both ahead. I think it's good to move them both ahead. Because there's, there's never a good time to do this stuff. We just need to keep trenching ahead. Well, in that case, then I would support what Bob said and, and try to do something that was mixed, if possible. And I, I think I've already expressed myself. I, I think I, I know I agree with Steve. Thank you. And we do Santa Margarita meetings, uh, the working group mix, where half of us are in the room and the other half are on video. So. I, 
it, it can be done. Yeah, I'm going to be flexible to that degree. Yes. We'll work on some dates. Okay, Great. Rick. Okay, back to you for uh, item 5C. 5C is the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Water Year 2020 stream flow um, operational gauging. Um, uh, the environmental planner, uh, Carly, uh, she will present these two items. Carly? Great. So starting in water year 2014, the district entered into a contract with Balance Hydraulics to monitor stream flow, salinity, and temperature for both operational and ecological monitoring or purposes. Um, this was kicked off in 2002 when CDFW, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, approached the district about its diversions effects on fisheries resources. After five years of the program in water year 2019, a redefined scope was determined um, to establish baseline conditions and to continue to provide data to the resource agencies. Also in water year 2019, the district requested to separate ecological and operational gauging. The ecological data will be used to evaluate the potential impact of diversions on stream flow and temperature for ecological regulatory purposes for habitat and for potential conjunctive use studies. The operational gauging program focuses on two real-time gauges on Clear Creek and Fall Creek, which have become important for operational management on the diversions for these two streams. The redefined scope also reduced cost from approximately $160,000 annually to approximately $73,000 annually. Um, attached below the memo are both the proposals for operational and ecological gauging proposals from Balance Hydraulics. Rick and I are here to answer any questions. Thank you, Carly. Uh, okay, uh, do we have any questions or comments from uh, any of the directors? Director Fultz? Yes, uh, thank you, Carly. Is this, um, is this measurement a, a permanent thing going forward? Um, that is, is it something that's going to be required every year, or is there a point at which we know enough to be able to make some conclusions? Which I think earlier studies showed that we weren't really impacting things at all from at least the environmental point of view. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm wondering where we go with this over the long term. Right. Can I answer that, Carly? Mm -hmm. okay. um, great question, Bob. We've just been having these discussions uh, with uh, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. As we are moving through that process, um, we're talking now about the impacts of surface water. Um, uh, the groundwater has impacts on surface water and about stream monitoring. And it looks like we're moving to move the stream monitoring into the county, uh, city of Santa Cruz and part of the, the JPA. So I, I wanna say that it's coming to an end because the county will be uh, taking over the monitoring most likely next year and then it will be going back to the JPA to, to discuss how we're gonna continue. Because there is going to be monitoring uh, monitoring wells uh, in, in the aquifer, and there is going to be some surface water monitoring. So as far as uh, the, the monitoring for, for fisheries and, and temp study and flows, I, I see that somewhat coming to an end solely for the district and to be shared more, um, but I also see us picking up monitoring wells as part of this JPA and the aquifer recharge. Um, I don't think it'll be a trade-off because it's a lot more inexpensive to monitor wells. It basically district staff can do it. We can go out with, uh, with laptops and, 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 and integrate um, data, data loggers and get information very quickly in our own staff where the stream and temp flows are very, as you can see, are costly and, and time consuming because there's re constant recalibration in the streams and so forth. But we still will have the Fall Creek and we still will have the operational Fall Creek and the op operational Clear Creek, which uh, are requirements from um, our permit and an easement requirement. Yeah, I understand. I mean, def if, the, if the data is still critical and, 
it needs to be used and there's a good return on it and all that, then, you know, we definitely want to do that. I it just, after the, you know, uh, almost million dollars we spent on it uh, already to prove basically what we'd been doing for 80 years didn't have an impact or, you know, any right. material impact. It's for like, how, how much further do you go now in terms of the other monitoring that we need to do, is there a way to, um, with some of the wells and that sort of thing, is there a way to automate that through SCADA systems or other remote sensing devices? Well, we just we just talked about it today, and unfortunately, you know, we're looking at, you know, if you get into SCADA, then you got to have communications, and then communications right now um, takes you know some type of, of carrier, you know, whether it's internet or cellular. There's some type of you know ongoing cost there. Um, you know, our other wells, we go out once a month. Uh, and we do uh, interrogation. It's not too bad. Areas where we have internet or communications, you know, it's, we can piggyback right in, and, and you know, there's no extra cost to the district. It's kind of hit and miss, and I doubt if they're going to place these new monitoring wells, you know, next to our other existing wells. You know, we're going to spread these out. So right now, you know, I, I really didn't want to go towards SCADA just because of the monthly costs. Um, associated with the data loggers and so forth. So it, it, it definitely needs to be looked at. Um, and we need to look at what's our, our best our best bang for the buck. But the information we're collecting is still good because we are going to be uh, addressing, we still are addressing our water rights in Felton, talking about the point of use to change that. We're reviewing water rights information. We've got the conjunctive use going on. And that data is being looked at and used. So we're getting somewhat of a return on our investment. And we scaled it way back from what we used to do. I mean, we used to spend considerably a lot more and we've cut it way back to just the bare minimum now. Yeah, no, thanks, appreciate it. Hey, any other uh, questions or comments from the board? How about from the uh, public? Let's see, uh, Mr. Lee has his hand up. Mark Lee, you have your hand up. You're on mute. There you go. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Uh, the other creek, uh, besides Fall Creek, uh, wasn't that one of the creeks that uh, was less impacted by uh, uh, salmon and uh, fillhead runs? By today, the, by the study that was uh, earlier uh, um, uh, presented at the environmental subcommittee meeting, I don't believe so. The the two that are on the operational are Fall Creek and Clear Creek. Uh, sure. uh, they weren't part of. Uh, Fall, we talked about Fall Creek today, which was a great presentation. There was a lot of great information uh, that came out of that today. But uh, uh, there are uh, concerns on on Clear Creek that we're monitoring. Okay. Thank you. Any other, uh, thank you, uh, Mark. Any other questions, comments from the public? Okay, back to the board. Then, uh, so we we have a uh, the recommendation is that we uh, allow you to enter into the contract with Balance Hydrologies. So I'll make a motion that we direct the uh, district manager to enter into the contract with Balance Hydrologies to continue this work. I'll second that motion, Steve. Thank you. Holly, would you like to record the vote? Muted, Holly. Oh, uh, yeah. I apologize, I couldn't find my slot. Um, Director Moran? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris? Oh, do we lose him again? Yeah. Director Ferris is not on. So what do I do, Gina? 
Um, I'd recommend doing the same thing as before, move on to the next um, agenda item and then come back and recall this vote uh, when Director Ferris joins the meeting. And then um, we might ask him when he gets back on whether, uh, you know, it's okay if he drops off again to move forward with votes without him. Okay, let's do that. Go ahead. Uh... Rick, let's move on to 5D, please. And when Lou shows up, we'll take another vote. Rick, you're muted. Rick, you're still mute. There, there we go. go. Okay, uh, we have uh, our next item is the revenue impacts from COVID-19. We have the finance manager that will present this item to the board. So this is more of just an informational item. Uh, it was requested at the Budget and Finance Committee uh, that we discuss this and they recommended that we bring it to the board for an update on some of the more recent impacts we're seeing from COVID-19. Overall, our district is not being severely impacted by the pandemic um, as some other neighboring agencies are. Um, a lot of this does have to do with the fact that we are highly residential. When you have places like Scott Valley, Santa Cruz, some of these you know cities and counties that rely so heavy on commercial use and you know the hospitality industry, stuff like that, they're seeing severe negative impacts where for the most part, we're not being remotely as impacted being mainly residential. Uh, the dry February and sheltering in place have actually led to an increase in water consumption during the month of March through May. Uh, there is a chart further down that does show uh, all of the, the numbers. Uh, when we look at consumption by type, that's kind of exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing our residential going up and the commercial properties going slightly down. Uh, you know, of the 7,900 connections, about 7,600 are some sort of residential. The increase in water consumption equates to about 0.8 units of water per month, uh, which is about 600 gallons more per month, which makes sense if you think of the average number in the household, flushing toilets, more stuff like that. That essentially... Um, will attribute to that. There also are a lot of people that are doing more gardening or homestead activities that are likely using a little bit more water. Uh, the district's consumption going up does directly equate to increased consumption revenue. Um, it still is important to note that the 2019 summer months that we had had lower than average consumption. Um, so we definitely still wanna make sure we're keeping an eye on some of this stuff. So that did sort of offset some of the, the increases that we recently saw in these more recent months. Property tax revenue, uh, while there has not been any notice or talk about it, it has happened in the past for a couple years where there was a major financial impact where special districts property tax revenues were suspended. Um, we're not there. We, we haven't heard anything. It's one of those things where, you know, we're really just going to have to deal with that if it comes to that. The district does receive about $800,000 a year in property taxes. So if something like that were to be suspended, um, you know, even temporarily, it would have a significant impact on our district. Um, past dues. So during the pandemic, the district suspended the past due procedures. This has caused an increase in delinquent accounts um, and the fees associated with the collection process. Approximately $24,000 in lost past due fees. The district typically brings in about $6,000 a month in, in past due penalties. Um, delinquent account balances have risen. Past dues typically are about 8 to 10% of the billing cycle. And currently they're at 12 to 14%. So we're looking at you know, fifty thousand ish plus more than what we're what we normally do see. Um, we do still have the long term delinquent accounts that are making up about one hundred and twenty thousand of um, on top of the the zero to ninety days. 
Uh, those will typically get repaid when properties do sell. The three main contributing factors to this zero to 90 past due, um, we don't know how much it's for each category, but kind of the things that we're able to get from talking to people is um, there's customers that who cannot pay their bills, and that is why they're past due. There's customers that choose not to pay since there's no penalties involved. Um, and then there are customers who rely on the past due process as their reminder to pay. So we're getting people that miss one bill, but then they get their next bill and see that there's a past due balance and try to true it up. Um, there likely will be a higher rate of uncollectible account balances. We don't really know how much at this point, um, but for now, the estimate is likely somewhere to between ten and fifty thousand um, dollars. It's one of those things where until we kind of start some of the past due process again, we won't know exactly what situation we're in. So a lot of this is again just informational to kind of let people know that you know obviously it can be assumed that our accounts receivable aging balance is going to go on the rise when you do stop collection procedures. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, do we have any questions uh, for Stephanie? Uh, Bob? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie, for the uh, overview on that. So if we take all these numbers, convert the usage to revenue and all that, what's your net-net on what we should ex uh, see for revenue uh, by June 30th? Is it going to be about the same as it's in our budget? Is it going to be uh, under, over, and if over, about how much? I think it's going to be coming in about 10,000 units higher, um, which is going to end up equating to about $115,000. Okay, so our revenue will be $115,000 higher than what's in the budget. Correct. Okay, and so, um, as of uh, and so the way that works is that extra money would then go into a reserve account. Is that the way that that would work? Correct. So what's going to end up happening is we'll be we'll, we will be showing uh, higher than expected reserve balance come 6-30-2020. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Any comments or questions from the public? Okay. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Stephanie, for all your diligence in uh, reading the uh, financial report. Well, it looks like we have the money now for the, <laughs> the Lira program after all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions or comments from the public? None. Okay, back to the board. Nothing. Okay. There's no activity. Thank you for the update, Stephanie. Uh, Rick, we'll move uh, move along to 5E. Okay, 5E is a uh, grand jury update, and District Council Nichols will give this presentation to the board. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, this agenda item was requested uh, by a board member. And um, so I provided a summary of the background related to the 2017-18 grand jury report entitled uh, Encouraging the Flow of Information to the Public. There's a link in the board memo to the grand jury's report, as well as the district's response to the report. And attached is a letter that the district received in spring of last year um, requesting some follow-up information and the also the district's response to that letter, uh, which was sent to the grand jury in June of last year. Um, at this time, the grand jury isn't seeking anything further from the district, um, but there, you know, there may be desire on the part of the board to, to take some follow-up actions. So uh, the staff is seeking direction from the board in terms of what uh, the board wants to do with respect to the grand jury report. Hey, uh, Bob, you have a 
question or comment? Yeah, so this was this was something that I'd asked about, and I, you know, I think that in the interests of, of transparency and making sure that we're taking the grand jury um, process seriously, which I know that we are, I do think it's important for us to report periodically back to the grand jury as to what our progress is. And, you know, whether that's every six months or every year, what have you, I, I, I still believe that we need to do that. I know we're very close to being done with all of the items that are uh, in there, but I think uh, having uh, uh, Gina draft a update letter with you know bullet points just reiterating what we're done, what we're where we are with the others would be very helpful, and it would also let the community know that we are taking this very seriously as well and are continuing to push forward to getting all of those recommendations completed. Okay, thank you, Bob. Any other? Uh comments or thoughts from the other directors? I think that sounds like a good idea. I'll raise my hand if I can, Steve. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I, I agree with Bob that the, the grand jury should uh, hear back from us and uh, it should be noted by the public as well. Um, in, in the evidence of that, you know, we just talked about uh, the strategic plan and the contentious issue. You know, the, this board is sincere in its efforts to resolve those questions that the grand jury brought up, and I'm glad to see that. And um, I think it's all positive of what we've done in response to the grand jury. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Director Ferris still seems to be missing in action. Uh, Lois, do you have any thoughts or comments on this? You want to weigh in? Well, I think that there's um, some things that um, the Lompico Oversight Committee has accomplished since the last time we reported. So it might be a good idea to report on that because that was a big part of the grand jury report was Lompico. Wait a bit. Uh, okay, great. Rick, uh, you have your hand up. Hang on. I, I, I agree that, you know, we'll move with this ahead, but we are very close to completing. I think we have three things left uh, on, the, on our objectives to, to complete that requirements or request from the grand jury. And that's, I think, is the, the, the training, contentious training, the uh, annual newsletter, for Lumpico of the LADOC committee. And then the third is the uh, uh, training for LADOC on, uh, on uh, certificates of participation. Um, maybe, I, I think I'd recommend we complete these three, and I'll, I'll ask Gina, and then we can send a final completion letter to the grand jury. I don't know, Gina, your thoughts? Because we are so close. It wouldn't take yeah. much to bring this over the line. Well, I, I, I'm more than willing to prepare something um, to the grand jury. Um, I, I guess I don't feel strongly about whether we do it now or whether we, you know, wrap up the few items and then just send a completion or prepare a completion letter. Um, might make sense to just do something once all the uh, recommendations are completed, the implementation is completed. Um, I, I personally, I would recommend styling it more as a memo to the file because the grand jury isn't asking for anything for us and they turn over every year and there's no reason to believe that they are you know, interested or paying attention to this. Um, but if we did something for our own purposes, it would you know, dot the I's and cross the T's in case any member of the public or a subsequent grand jury or anyone else is interested in how we completed um, the response to these recommendations. So, but but I don't feel strongly about any of these things, and I certainly would take the board's direction in terms of how to document this. Okay, thank you, Gina. Bob, your thoughts? Yeah, Gina, I, I understand your point about you know memo to file, but part of this is also communication with the public, and I'm not sure exactly how the memo to file works on, on that. Whereas uh, the communication to the to the grand jury itself, I think, would help in that. 
Um, Rick, what's the anticipated completion of these remaining three items? I, I believe the, the biggest hurdle is for training on, depending, and I haven't talked to Stephanie in depth, um, the training for the Laddock Committee. And I'm not too sure um, how many folks we have left on the, on the Laddock. Um, but I would think that we ought to be able to get it over the, over the finish line within the next month and a half, month, month and a half. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I appreciate that, but the, the training for the LADOC committee has actually been one of those that has been, um, I think, maybe um, uh, difficult for us to uh, address. I mean, I know the committee wanted that training, like, you know, uh, many months ago, um, and I don't know that we've necessarily found anybody to conduct that. Um, and perhaps at the end of the day, that's one that just can't be fulfilled, even though we have every intention of trying to do it. And I think it's because of the uncertainty around that one that I'm suggesting that we provide an update. And then if there's, uh, if that is able to get done within the next um, a couple, three months or, or so, or, you know, six months or what have you, then we can write another uh, letter to, uh, to, to them saying we concluded it. But if we don't have anybody lined up right now to, actually do the training, then I, I, I don't know that, I, I am skeptical that it could be done in a, in a month, month and a half, even with the best of intentions, which I know that we all have. And I, and I haven't really discussed with Stephanie, but you know, given the current situation where the assessment district funds have been spent, you know, I, I'm not sure of, you know, if, if there's still a need, but I guess, you know, I, we could talk to the, the LADOC chair of the LADOC committee. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, the funds may have been spent, but the project still, has not been completed. Right. The, the projects are not being completed. And, and until those projects are completed, we have not fulfilled the promises that we made to Lompico. Okay. Zephy, do you have any thoughts on, I know you did some research and on, on possible training. So NBS does, I mean, they do specialize in assessment districts. Um, they have a lot of literature around what assessment districts are. They did say that they could do a training. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where each assessment district is, is different. So, I mean, they don't provide legal advice or stuff like that, but they can go over kind of how assessment districts run. They are familiar with ours, so they can speak to some of the stuff around ours. But a lot of them are, I mean, it's similar to a road association or a HOA. It's more of a self-governing um, type of thing. But, I mean, they do offer that type of stuff. And he did say, um, you know, he, he wouldn't physically come up here, but he would be able to, do, to host a remote session. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. If I mean, if we can commit to getting it done in the next month, a month and a half, then we can delay the letter. I'm, I just, it's, this has been ongoing for a while. I agree. So do we feel confident enough that we can get it done in the next, you know, uh, 45 days to delay sending anything now? With, with your strategic plan task. <laughs> we'll get... We'll we'll look into this, and, and if it's going to be a significant significant delay, we'll get back to the board to do an update. Let's uh, yeah, let's have an update at the next board meeting. That's a month away, so that would be that would be good. If we could just put an informational item on the agenda, Steve, for for the uh, update. Right. Okay. Steve. Yes. I'm back online if you want to take that vote. Oh, terrific. Okay. <laughs> well, and could I suggest, uh, I'm not sure we got public comment on this item. Maybe we could do that and close out this item and then go back to the vote on 5C. Sure. Okay. Is there, uh, yeah, hang on, Lou, don't, don't hang up. Uh, any public comment regarding the uh, topic of sending an update to the grand jury? Yeah, I don't see any uh, hands coming up, so so that's the direction. Then we'll wait uh, 
and see where we are at the next uh, board meeting in a month from now. Steve, I would like to make a comment about the uh, grand jury report. Okay, please do. Having worked in a highly regulated environment for several decades, one of the things that you definitely want to do after a major effort like this, where you've, where if it's a legal or a regulatory issue, and and you spend a lot of time and effort trying to resolve uh, issues, you not only want to finish what you, what you committed to, but then you want to do a file review of everything that you've got to make sure, you know, basically doing a you know, coming back around and reviewing one more time, did we in fact cover everything and did we in fact do everything that we're supposed to do? And it should be contained in a separate file onto itself so that if anybody comes out, comes comes back, you know, years from now and says, what happened to the grand jury reports? We have everything in one place and can produce the information for somebody to look at. We call it a file review and even an effective an effectiveness or an effectivity review before you close the file. After you think you've completed everything. Okay. Good suggestion, Lou. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Rick, so we'll revisit this in a month. See where we are with those three outstanding items. And then send or not send uh, in a follow up to the grand jury on that. And we'll, I'll work with council and Stephanie and we will get back to the board and get this Rick. wrapped up. Okay. Uh, Holly, would you like to re record the vote on item 5C? Uh, 5C, yeah. 5C, yeah. Authorizing the district manager to enter into a contract with balance hydro hydro balance with balance. <laughs> Director Moran? Yes. Director Henry? Yes. Director Fulls? Yes. President Swan? Yes. Director Ferris. Oh no. He's gone again. No, he's not. Oh, he's, on mute. he's there, but he's muted. Get off mute, Lou. Oh, there he is. Hi. Okay. Take it away, you got it. So, okay, uh, we got it. Director Ferris? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. And President Swan, if, if I may, I just want to be clear that. Um, in this type of a situation, we could mark a director, you know, absent for the time that they drop off and, you know, take the vote with, with somebody marked absent. We, we haven't wanted to do that. Certainly that's not something we want to do in this bizarre sort of Zoom meeting format. Um, but if, if, and we were able to accommodate it, but I just want everybody to know that that is something we could do. So, um, and we may need to, if it were impractical to circle back to an item like we did this evening. Okay, is every director good with that in case one of us loses uh, connectivity again or something? Yes. And I apologize for being a problem tonight. Yeah, no. and I, and I'm sorry to put, put you on the spot. I don't, I don't mean to, but I just, I don't want to set a precedent that we have to, you know, circle back to items if it's not practical to do that for a vote. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good with that. Lois is good with that, aren't you, Lois? Yes. I Thank you, Lois. Bob, you're okay? You're on mute, Bob. Yes. Thank you. Okay, moving along. All right. Uh, um, General Rogers. Okay, item uh, 5F, uh, Director Fultz request for financial information. Recommended that the board of directors review the memo and attachments and give direction to the district manager uh, regarding request for financial information from Director Fultz and discuss moving forward uh, as requested. On May 28, 2020, we received a request for information from Director Fultz through Chair Swan. It's attached in your packet. 
requesting financial information, and it refers to agendize liabilities and promises. The attached request speaks for itself. In an effort to comply with this press staff believes this information request will take uh, a great deal of time to complete and board discussion is needed. A lot of this information has been provided and there are documents such as the cost of service study providing some of the requested information. Staff have already uh, explained that they are working on a lot of uh, this in conjunction with the master plan. Uh, attempting to provide this type of information ahead of the master plan is extremely burdensome and inefficient as consultants are actively working on a large portion uh, of this. Staff agreed that having a capital maintenance master plan can lead to a well-informed financial plan. Staff has been uh, providing related information during the budget process. We just recently provided water tank maintenance analysis to the board. Uh, we state all liabilities on our balance sheets as required. Pensions and OPEC liabilities have been discussed and are on the books. The assets and related uh, depreciation are also on the books. We don't fully understand concerns regarding promises. The water master plan will provide a considerable amount of information and is scheduled to be completed in November, 2020. Staff feel that uh, we can prepare the overall capital and financial reports by March, 2021. Um, staff understands the need for this information, but direction is needed on moving forward. We need a long range plan starting with uh, the street plan and water master plan. Uh, the district's uh, finance manager has prepared a roadmap um, to moving forward and I will ask Stephanie for her presentation. Okay, so kind of since we've talked about some of these subjects a couple times, um, we thought that it would be nice to put together a roadmap to kind of show how we are envisioning these different pieces coming together and kind of a timeline for those so that everyone can maybe get on, on the same page as to expectations. Um, so what is a roadmap? A roadmap is a long view of where our district currently is, what we want to achieve, and how we're going to get there. The purpose of the roadmap is to establish a strategic framework to help guide our district to its ultimate goal. Uh, currently, the district has been working hard to get back on track. Um, you know, honestly, there's been a history of circumstances that have hindered forward progress over the last, you know, five plus years. These have varied from natural disasters, contentious discussions high volume of changeover in board members and district managers, all of these different things are going to kind of cause a delay in a lot of these items that require a lot of um, collaborative work with each other. In 2017, the district did a cost of service study and is in the process of completing the master plan. Uh, these are critical items to help us get to best practices so that we can have a much better long-term planning capability. Uh, at times, there have been so many different plans and initiatives that it's easy to get slowed down and paralyzed with over-planning. Uh, there are basics that we want to get established. And once we kind of get these basics, that's when a lot of the pieces start to fall in line a little bit easier. Where do we want to be? Uh, we want to have a strategic plan that the district can align other plan objectives objectives with to achieve the goals and mission of the district. We want to have a manageable capital asset management plan that staff can continue to update and inform the board and public over the years as we go. Uh, the, the camp is going to allow for a much better long-term financial plan. This will give insight into financial capacity for the best ways to plan and achieve the long-term objectives in the strategic plan. And then having all these pieces in place will allow us to do more forward projections, will allow us to do biennial budgeting and you know, those types of things. Uh, first step is the strategic plan. Uh, I did an excerpt from uh, GFOA's best practices for you know, kind of what a strategic plan is. We're kind of all, you know, aware of it, but it does give, you know, it does help show that there is a very important focus on a strategic plan to help align all of the organizational resources and goals to kind of build on each other. Um, after that, the capital asset management plan. 
So we are in the thick of the district's master plan. It's scheduled to be completed in November, 2020. This is going to have a lot of the data that's going to help pull the large capital asset together. We've seen things from the uh, director of operations for some of the tank maintenance, the meter replacement program, all of those different types of things are going to, to go into this overall management plan. And then that's going to really help us focus in and plan out years one, years five, and years 10 of, of what to expect. Once we have that, then obviously we're able to pull the long-term full financial plan together with, you know, you can, we can have some different assumptions around operating expenses that are a little bit easier to, to forecast debt, that sort of stuff. The capital aspect is really one of the more fluid ones that, that can change significantly from year to year, depending on what's going on. Um, so what now? So strategic plan, we've already discussed it. You know, we want to get the ball rolling. It sounds like we are moving in that direction. Um, we assign tasks and a timeline and, you know, it should be completed before end of 2020. The capital asset management plan, the master plan is coming November 2020. Um, we feel staff can take that and then integrate it all together by the end of January 2021. And then that's going to lead us into the financial plan, hopefully being able to be formed by March of 2021, which will fit in line with we could potentially have a draft biennial budget um, if all goes smoothly for, for the upcoming budget year and fiscal year um, 2021, which would get us through the, the 2023. So that would be a completion by June of 2021. So that's just kind of a timeline to kind of show some of that it's hard when there's questions that that board members have that we agree are valid and we want to try and get them answered um, we're hoping that kind of presenting everyone with the timeline and what we're planning um, will help show and keep us accountable to that progress uh, to get us kind of those these large very, I mean, these are large, complicated items um, to get us to the to the finish line with some of these. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, okay, any uh, questions or comments from uh, anybody? Bob, you're recognized. Yeah, I want to thank um, uh, Steve for getting on the agenda, and and Rick and Stephanie for putting together that information. I think these are, um, as Stephanie was saying, very critical items. And, and I wanna make sure that um, the, the reasons and the backup of why I wanted to put this on the agenda are, are clearly understood. Um, and it really has to go to, um, uh, at a board level, a policy level, understanding um, what the what is facing the district and what is facing the board, what is facing our ratepayers um, as a result of all the decisions that have been made up until now and where we are right now. Um, we currently have approximately, and, I, and Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we currently have approximately $3 million in what I call margin, that is the um, revenue minus expenses that are available for us to spend on um, projects that are facing us. And um, that, that $3 million basically has to go to cover the following items. And some of these items, you know, regrettably, the nature of accounting doesn't really lead you to including these in formal balance sheets and that sort of thing, because those are mostly retrospective. But when you look at uh, prospective going forward, Rick, I think we have about 160 miles of pipe, more or less, all told, uh, of all sizes. So, you know, if we were to take an average of, let's say, $300 a foot, and I think our current uh, installation costs for the California and Hillside projects are closer to 400, you know, that's approximately $253 million in replacement cost um, uh, of our pipe which if you look at needing uh, to do the, that on a 50 year cycle, you're looking at about 6 million a year. Um, 
Now, it may not be 250 million, maybe it's 150 million, maybe it's 200, but somewhere in that range, we're going to be looking at having to spend between three and $5 million a year just on prospective capital going forward. That doesn't count the capital that's retrospective, where over the last uh, 20, 30 years, we've not spent nearly enough on infrastructure, and so we're having to catch up in that. And that's probably in the order of another million to, to two uh, million a year, which we would probably fund by taking out loans similarly to what we did with uh, the five pipeline projects here recently. So when you add that up, just those two things alone, you're looking at um, oversubscribing our margin by anywhere from 2x to the 3x. That doesn't include the 10 million in tanks. That doesn't include the 4 million in meters. A lot of the meters are reaching the end of their life. I don't really have numbers on pumps, wells, you know, generators, all those things that we have to replace. Uh, the PERS liability in our books is based on a number that the PERS staff um, puts out there, but it doesn't really reflect the reality of uh, where we are. And at a, at a board level, because these promises are so solemn, we need to be cognizant of the fact that at any point in time in the future, PERS could very easily come back and say, well, the real return on investment isn't 7%, it's more like 5.8%, which has been the 20-year average. And so your liability now goes from three and a half million to, let's say, you know, five million, six, six million. And that's a substantial jump up because PERS refuses for whatever reason to basically accept the reality that you're not going to get a real return of investment, a real re rate of return on your investment of a broad-based large fund like that, five or six points over real economic growth. It's just not happening. And then on top of that, we have our um, uh, uh, other liabilities um, around uh, vacation and OPEB, which are not nearly as big, probably in the order of a million to a half million. Uh, we have whatever we want to spend on Lira programs out of our property tax, um, 25000 now, but I think we all have said that it, it probably needs to be bigger. Um, we still have a lot of the Lompico projects to complete. Um, I believe that money's all been spent. So what we have to do uh, now for what's left is, is we're going to have to take that out of um, uh, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District pockets. And that's probably somewhere in the order of two to three million in order to keep those promises. We have whatever we're going to spend in Santa Margarita over and above what we're spending now. And then we have special projects like the Lion Slide, three million plus, Loch Lomond Water, the last estimate I saw was 6 million, and that was a long time ago. So when you start looking at all these numbers and you start matching that up against the 3 million in margin that we have, um, we are at a very substantive crossroads. And so while I appreciate the, um, the meth methodical way uh, that we, we outlined in terms of approaching this, at, at a board level, at a policy level, we need to be thinking about the implications of what all of these numbers mean for the board, for the ratepayers, and for the community at large. And I think we can actually um, move down the path simultaneously, looking at estimates and other information as it becomes available, like the tank information, which I thought was just fantastic to get that information, not fantastic from the point of view of the number associated with it, but fantastic to understand what the liability is to the district because of the lack of maintenance over the last 25 years since a lot of those tanks have been installed. And these are the kinds of things that I think um, the conversations that need to take place in parallel with the master plan and all the other things because you know, you're just not going to drop on the community this kind of information without uh, having a, a lot of in-depth conversation amongst us at committee level. Uh, how are we going to deal with this? You know, what is the goal and objective? Um, how do we address this, uh, given historically what has regrettably been massive underfunding in infrastructure? So that's the reason for putting it on the agenda to basically make sure that we understand that these numbers are uh, large, 
um, they outstrip our current ability to uh, fund them. And at some point, we're going to have to have very serious conversations about how this gets addressed and how this is going to get paid for. Um, and those options are to, you know, basically continue what we're doing. It is to try to put in place some get well plans, which are going to require additional funding. Uh, it may be that there's other grant programs or other infrastructure improvement uh, funding that we can take advantage of, though I think we all understand that over the last 20 years or so, the feds have really cut back on all of that. So uh, at some level, this is our community and our community's responsibility to, to deal with these things. And, you know, perhaps on the next uh, annual report, we might be looking at how to uh, put some of this information on there because it's not immediately clear uh, uh, where that is currently in the annual report because, again, most of the balance sheet, asset information, and all that is based on historical which is a fraction of what the replacement cost is uh, going forward. So um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to um, have the budget committee uh, start to undertake these conversations to try to start doing some estimates and getting, you know, some basic sizing of things that'll get more refined, of course, over time as we uh, move through the master plan. Uh, but starting the conversations about how we're going to pay for all this as early as possible, um, we just can't start early enough. So I would still like to ask that we direct the budget committee to undertake this uh, effort and get these conversations started. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Lois, you have your hand up. Yeah, I'm really confused. What's confusing? Because in Bob's email to you, Steve, he says, Rick has suggested that the budget committee take it up immediately. But based on how we agreed to manage committees this year, I didn't think that would be a good idea. And he just said the opposite. I, I, I don't understand. Okay. Well, I'm sure Bob will uh, have a chance to explain that to you. Anybody else have a comment, question? No? Because it's, it's I'll, I'll, sounds I'll like Seth laid out a, uh, a roadmap for how we get, go through the various processes of accumulating the necessary data, which is a, a time consuming process, very laborious, uh, uh, in conjunction with everyone's day job, and we don't have a massive staff or anything. But um, but I, I think Stephanie laid out, as Bob mentioned, a very sort of comprehensive roadmap about how we can get uh, to the end of the road and and be able to answer and have a better understanding of all the data that uh, that's necessary for the board and the public to understand where we are and to be able to make those long-term planning decisions that the board's responsible for. But, but it also goes to illustrate, I think, where, you know, when we have a lot of, uh, if, the, if the staff is receiving, you know, tremendous amounts of ad hoc requests for financial information on a regular basis, it can really, it, it skews things to the point where the data you're getting may or may not be that accurate. It, it doesn't have the the uh, the prerequisites completed and in place, and that uh, it it doubles the amount of effort of staff time, which is very precious. So you know, I, I think that's where a lot of the concern came in, and I think with this roadmap helps clarify that we need to let the staff who are the experts in this area and who have the, their hands closest to gathering this information that's necessary, uh, be allowed to do their jobs. And I think, I think Stephanie's roadmap hel helps illustrate exactly what they need to do and not be burdened with too many uh, ad hoc requests for any and all data, whether it's financial data, whether it's maintenance data, whether it's how many pipe miles of pipe we have, whether it's how many tanks are leaking and where the leaks are, you know, let the staff do their jobs and, and, uh, and not burden them, as I said, 
with a bunch of ad hoc requests for data and information. Uh, Bob, you have a comment. Yeah, and you know, I, there's uh, nothing in what I've talked about that requires massive um, uh, time involved. Uh, this is all basically uh, doing estimates uh, based on what we know as, as best practices and based on what we uh, I believe the, these numbers are going to come in at. Let's say, for example, our capital uh, replacement cost for all that pipeline comes at 150 million. Well, you know, we still have to spend three million a year replacing it. The, the, this is not a uh, laborious, time-consuming process to start at a board level. Um, how we're going to uh, categorize the various things that we're going to need to look at, because in the in the presentation that was given. It, it, it focused on a couple of areas, but it didn't focus on uh, the, the, the district holistically and all the things I was talking about. Um, perhaps those will all be sub uh, tasks on there, that'd be great. But I think, I think what we need to do at the budget committee level is go through, understand what these categories are gonna be, understand where they're gonna be in whatever the process is that we're gonna go through and start talking about what those estimates are so that um, we can, as a board, start getting our hands around and our sort of minds around just ex exactly how large this number is. It is unbelievable. Uh, tens of millions of dollars that we are uh, facing here. And we're basically generating $3 million a year in margin dollars. Um, now, you know, there's various ways of being able to finance capital projects. I, I certainly understand that. Um, and this is also part of the conversations that we need to be having as to how that's gonna take place. And I think all that needs to be done in parallel um, because at the end of the day, we're the ones that are responsible to our bosses. And our bosses are the public and the people that expect us to be having these kinds of conversations uh, on their behalf. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. But I mean, I think we have to let the staff and the, the, the district manager do their job. I mean, the board selects the district manager. The district manager selects the staff and we let the district manager and the staff do their jobs. And I don't want to be burdening them with uh, hunting up a lot of uh, ad hoc information and ancillary details that they, they don't need to be doing. We need you know, to Steve, I didn't ask for any of that. I basically asked for the budget committee to look at the categories that we're talking about here and start putting breadbasket estimates around them, just like you would do in any other environment. Well, that, I think we can, we can agree on that, Bob. It should be in the budget committee. Okay, well, that I just want this sent to the budget committee so that we can start looking at framing how we're going to be doing this and helping the staff with putting together putting together how we're going to do this. Okay. Uh, Lou, you had a comment? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, somebody's going to have to help me because it's not clear to me. I, I, I understand there's an issue here, but I'm not really clear what the issue is. Is it that we're asking for too much from staff too quickly? Or, or asking for something that that's that's unreasonable, or they don't agree with. I mean, what, what what's the issue that that we're that we're trying to come to grips with here? So help me. So, Lou, I think as as I understand it, is that we have a, a number of requests that come in continually for a large amount of information on a regular basis that overwhelms the staff. And a lot of the stuff is kind of like putting the cart before the horse because Stephanie had taken the time to put together this roadmap that shows how we can come to the uh, conclusion that we're looking for financially to have all of the various answers to the questions that Bob's talking about, but to do so in, a, in this uh, structured and methodical fashion rather than receiving ad hoc requests for X amount of data and detail that they receive from time to time. And I think that uh, the, that can lead to a certain level of frustration and can distract them from their normal work, their normal day-to-day -day jobs. Now, it sounds like Bob doesn't think that the information that he's been talking about is very difficult to come by uh, and that it should be able to be gathered very quickly. But 
uh, I'm getting sort of a contradictory feeling from staff. Let okay. Me, let me let me help you out here. For so, for example, um, on the tank uh, spreadsheet that uh, James put together, which was very helpful, um, you know, basically, if what we're doing is saying, okay, we got thirty tanks, and the average cost per tank is uh, three hundred thousand dollars. Boom, we have at least a breadbasket from which we can start uh, having conversations about how we're going to finance that. This is not a lengthy, drawn-out conclusion. Now, to get to fine detail, which is designs and RFPs and all that sort of thing, absolutely, that requires all of the process that has been discussed about. But in terms of being able to get ourselves ready for what is coming, these are the kind of breadbasket estimates that we need to be making, and they don't require a lot of time. Okay. Uh, if, if I may continue, Steve? Sure, go ahead, Lou. Uh, I, I think I understand the problem now, and my comment is this. Um, I have learned the hard way that being a board member is not easy. We walk a fine line sometimes. We need information to be able to make an informed decision, uh, an informed decision on how we're going to vote on upcoming agenda items. So we need information, and the people that have the information is typically staff. So we make requests of staff uh, for information. Now, staff, as you pointed out, Steve, has a day job, and you know they're. I mean, they want to please the directors because they realize that in in a way we 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 at least control the purse strings, if nothing else. And you know they want to please us, but at the same time they need to get their job done. So here's the way I look at that in terms of walking that fine line. I think we have every right to ask for something from staff, that is board members. Likewise, staff has every right to say no. And they don't have to explain no. I'll give you an example. I asked uh, Rick Rogers uh, a while back if I could participate in a process. He thought about it for a minute and he said no. And I said, okay, thank you. Because I trust him that if he said no, he had a good reason. And there's, you know, me trying to, to convince him that I needed it now was just not going to make it happen. So I, I need to at least wait and come back again and ask the same question. So uh, again, it, to me, it's simple. The, the, we, the, the board member has the right to ask a question and the staff member has the right to say no. It's as simple as that. So I'm, I'm not sure what we're looking for here other than trying to get the directors to vote on what one board member wants, which I think is inappropriate. It sets a bad precedent. You know, we, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, um, I don't want to get involved with what Bob wants from, say, Stephanie, because they should be able to work it out. And if they can't, then they should elevate it to, say, Stephanie's boss, Rick, and, you know, uh, the president of the board, Steve, and somehow come to an understanding of, of what is acceptable. But, you know, I, I, again, I, I believe that, that we cannot take too much time out of staff's day to do their day job. We, you know, we, our answers are not the most important thing to them, even though they may be the most important thing to us. But if we take that view, like I do, that, you know, I, I have the right to ask a question and they have a right to say no, I think it, it, it goes a long way towards avoiding the, the, the back and forth of, well, but I need it, so I, you know, please give it to me, and, I, and well, I can't because I don't have time. You know, it's, that's the way it is. And anyway, that's, that's my opinion. Well, Lou, I, I agree with you with one caveat. I don't think that board members should be making requests of staff, period. They, well, when I say staff, I mean Rick. I mean, I mean when I ask yeah. for... Yeah, when I ask for something from staff, I ask Rick. Yeah. Or oh, I ask him, Rick, can I talk to somebody that works for you? You know, I never, you know, go out of the chain of command. So right. that, you're right, I stand, I stand corrected. When I say staff, I really mean Rick. Right. Uh, okay, uh, Lois, I see your, um, your blue paw up. I think part of the issue here is staff is happy to answer questions. But there have been times <clears throat> when staff answers the question and then more questions are brought forward. Those questions are answered 
and then more questions are brought forward. And I think we saw a perfect example at a board member at a at a board meeting too long ago. Um, and I'm I'm not even going to go into it because I don't want to be contentious. Uh, but bottom line, if you ask a question, it gets answered. You should go away and wait for a while before you say, well, golly, I appreciate that. But I also want to know this, this, and this about the item. And that's been happening. Uh, thank you, Lois. Uh, Bob, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I, I think we've lost sight of what the request was. And if, if the board doesn't want to uh, take this up, that's fine. This, this really has nothing to do with, with me um, or any board director in general. This has to do with whether or not the board wishes the budget committee to take up the task of looking at the categories of capital uh, requirements that we have to uh, in conjunction with the work that's going to be going on anyway, to make sure that all of the categories, all of the areas that we have facing us that are either liabilities or promises or good business practices or what have you are being covered as we put together what uh, plans we're gonna have for spending the $3 million in margin we get every year uh, against the uh, tens of millions of dollars that are are facing us here over the next um, next ten years, and that's it. Uh, the rest of it is immaterial. It's a question whether the board wants the budget committee working out or not. If the answer is no, um, okay, I understand. No, I think that's that's precisely what we were agreeing to is that it should go to the committee. And the committee should, within its charter, work on all of those areas that you just talked about. And I'm glad that you okay. agree that, that we should, if any board member has any questions for anybody in the staff, that they should go through the district manager. Yeah, which is, which I think we all uh, uh, emphatically agree upon and which I believe all of us are doing. Okay, terrific. Uh, well, somebody else had a comment here? No. Okay, any other uh, directors want to weigh in on this? Have any comments? Otherwise, we'll let the public share their wisdom with us. Okay. Uh, what happened to the public comment? Lee Summers, no. Mark Lee, no. Are you guys farting around? Do you have a question or not? Yes, I do. Okay, well, put your hand up and leave it up. Don't, don't be flashing at me. Go ahead, Mark. Trying to get your attention there, President. Uh, I appreciate the uh, discussion regarding the strategic plan and Stephanie's roadmap. It is needed. It's a very complicated process, but it can be done, as, as Bob indicated, uh, with an overview using buckets of information to at least create a uh, strategic plan that will lead to a, a financial plan and, and uh, et cetera. However, we're leaving out a most important element of the planning process, and that is there's no been no discussion at all on what the gross national income is for the 90, 19,000 rate, or the, the roughly 22,000 rate payers in the water district and whether they're able to afford this great li looming liability that's facing us. There's been no discussion, and it should be, it uh, should, should be included. We need to know whether the current ratepayers have the ca capacity based on income analysis, on based on annual income by uh, staff, a person here, whether they, uh, be, uh, annual income of the various uh, residents in the area to come up with an, a, a fairly good feel on whether, what percentage of the uh, population here being served by the water district can actually afford these expensive capital facilities plans. And I have some ideas on how to cut those expenses, but I think uh, we need to include that. Otherwise, we're, we're you're planning inside of a vacuum. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other uh, public comment? Uh, 
Okay, back to the board. There is a, so thank you for that presentation, Stephanie. And I think other than the direction that we've provided, which is to send a lot of this back to the committee, as Bob mentioned, as that Rick has suggested, uh, that's the uh, that's the direction I guess we're providing to the staff. I don't know that there is. We need to take a motion or make a vote on anything. Gina, do you care to weigh in on that? Uh, no, there doesn't need to be a vote or a motion uh, as long as the district manager is clear as to what is being referred to the budget and finance committee. I, I think that'll do it. Rick, do you have any questions? Not this time. No. Okay, great. Uh, Stephanie, uh, do you? Stephanie is uh, a huge part of the budget committee. Obviously, do you have any comments? Uh, no, it's fine. I mean, we can take it to budget and finance and figure out a game plan there. Gotcha. Okay. Moving right along. I smell the finish line. Okay. Uh, item six on the agenda. Uh, Rick, I see there is no new business. Correct. On the consent agenda, does anybody uh, wish to have anything pulled from the minutes of the June 4th meeting? No, I'll take that as a no. Okay. Uh, any any uh, update on the district department status reports? I, I'd like to make one comment before we get in. This is uh, our district engineer's last board meeting. He will be retiring. Uh, I do believe he's been patiently waiting uh, um, in the audience. Uh, this is his last status report. We wish him the best. This is his second time retiring, and we will miss him. And even the short time he was here, he's had a lot of accomplishments and moved a lot of big projects forward. And uh, I've appreciated his service and his expertise and knowledge moving these projects forward. Absolutely. D Darren, uh, best of luck to you. Thank you very much for all of your efforts and uh, the great work you've been here and the short time that you've been here, it's been very noticeable and very impactful. Definitely. Uh, and, and we're all very grateful and, and appreciate and are glad to hear that you might be staying in the area. So best of luck to you and, and best wishes to you and your family with your future plans. Anything you want to say, Darren? Wipe that tear off your eye, Darren. Lose <laughs> him? <laughs> you might have got tired of waiting. He's not there. He's breeze. He went to bed. Okay, he left. Well, save that. All right. Yeah. Anybody else retiring? No? Holly? No. Okay. Yeah, are there any uh, status reports in that anybody feels uh, that they would like to share with us from environmental, finance, and business, legal operations? Anything that they want to comment on? No. Well, how about the committees? Anybody have any committee reports that they want to share or talk about? Director? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say we had an environmental committee meeting. Today, uh, we had a presentation by uh, Mike. Uh, help me out, Carly. What was his last name? Pollock? Podell, I do believe. Podlick. Podlick. Pod <clears throat> about conjunctive use. And it was mostly informational, but um, we're working and uh, on maintaining uh, good conditions for the fisheries and for uh, water supply. Sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. In its own way it was, Steve. And, <laughs> and in our packet, we have a letter from PG&E in response to our letter. And uh, there's some information on the uh, SLV and the press banner. So I won't go into those. So with that being said, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you all for your participation and for the public's participation as well. Y'all have a good night. Good night. Peace, Steve.